Welcome to day two of our coverage from Gamescom 2023 from the center of all things Xbox. And if you can't be here with us in Germany, no problem, because today we're getting you up close and personal with the largest Xbox booth in Gamescom history and some of the experiences inside. We find out what's in store for Alan Wake 2 direct from Sam Lake himself. Plus, we've got an all new, never before seen gameplay trailer for Stalker 2. You don't want to miss it. And we will see what fans can expect from Forza Motorsport, our history untold, like a Dragon Gate and the man who raised his name, and the action puzzle you saw as we fire up the consoles and PCs for a day of gaming goodness. But first, it's an expansion that fans can't wait to get their cyber enhanced hands on. Our very own Henry got a chance to talk with CD Projekt Red about the upcoming expansion, Phantom Liberty. I'm over here with Gabe from CD Projekt Red to talk all things Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty. Gabe, how you doing? I'm good, I'm well. I'm Amazing. excited. Yeah, you should be. Yeah. All right. Well, last talk. night was crazy. I mean, opening night live. What was your reaction to seeing how everybody took it all in? I had so much fun. It's yeah. so much fun. We're excited. It seems like a lot of people are excited. So let's get this thing out there. <laughs> Now, it's pretty clear Phantom Liberty is super anticipated by gamers all across the globe. And you and CD Projekt Red have been working really hard and listening to the community feedback as well. Why don't you give us a peek into some of the reworked systems? Sure. So there's so many. And maybe I can say kind of like a highlight what the inspiration was. We had such a beautiful, incredible world with so much potential. We wanted to infuse it with a bit more life. Mm. So we have a lot of new systems and new AI improvements and new fantasy fulfilling kind of abilities and stuff like that that you can do. We revamped the police system so you can get in trouble. You can fight max tech if you really get up there in trouble. Really max tech? Max tech Oh, indeed. we're so screwed. <laughs> yes, yes. And there's various different archetypes of the max tech units and they have different mechanics and things like that. The police we have uh, in Dogtown, it's a different uh, crew. It's the bar guests who are like the law enforcement there, part of Kurt's militia. And then of course, NCPD. And if you go to the Badlands, then it's Militech that are gonna enforce the areas there. So there's a big variety, a lot of stuff. We've got uh, like the player's an agent in the world and the world reacts to the player, but also you'll see like gangs fighting each other and chasing each other in cars and stuff like that. So there's other agents in the world as well. So again, the world was so much potential and we just wanted to infuse it with a bit more life in a kind of dynamic system way. That's amazing. I mean, why don't you talk a bit more about those new systems? I mean, what in particular has been added to Phantom Liberty that players should be excited about? Sure, so I, I touched on the police system and stuff like that. I should talk about the skill nice. trees and stuff like that. So one of our big inspirations in revamping, we revamped the skill trees almost entirely. And one of our big inspirations is that we wanted to have sort of like, when you think about this world with cyberware, right? And, and the dark future, mm. you've got certain fantasies in mind of kind of like, ways you'd want to play and ways you want to be. Do you want to be like the, you know, the fast marshal, you know, with the with the sword, right? Do you want to be the net runner? Do you want to be Terminator, right? Yeah. Like that kind. And so now we've got these abilities where you can pick up bodies and throw it. <laughs> you can be right in the middle of like the crossfire. And as long as you keep pushing that attack, you'll be regenerating, you know, your life and you'll be getting into a fury state. And of course, there are some edge runner Easter eggs in I there. I do love that. Where you're kind of going on the edge, you can push your cyberware to the limit and occasionally, you know, get into a fury state because of it and start to lose some life. But if you're in this Terminator style build, you can be like pushing the attack and regaining your life doing it. So it like complements it well. I'm, I'm rambling now, I'm going on. I There's love just it, so man. much. There's just I'm already so much. concocting like Sandivistan, Gorilla Arms. Let's just make like a David uh, build. You know arms. what I mean? I'm yes. so into it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 nice. And the new trailer that you premiered at Opening Night Live, we got a look at some new car combat mechanics, which is yes. brand new as well. Yes. How did that all come together? Well, I mean, it's, it's fun, right? It's all part of getting that, making the world feel more alive, more like what your expectations is, right? And when you get in the car, yeah, you can pull out an SMG start fighting your enemies, you know, doing wheelies, screeching, whatever. Uh, you can get on a bike, you can pull out your katana blade, slice some oh, tires. Nice. And then when you slice their tires, they'll like veer and you can get them crashing and stuff like that. And of course, we've got some vehicles that uh, have weapons mounted on them. Oh. So uh, we've got this Bond-inspired style vehicle where these two little nozzles come out the front. And you start... Oh, that's and cheeky. Just, yeah. 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 And then we got like an APC that has a missile rack and a couple others that have missile racks. And so, yes. 
Okay, so maybe Max Tacker got something coming back to them as well then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you as you kind of push the police systems, they'll start bringing out vehicles with mounted weapons uh, as well. I mean, what I really love as well is the fact it's almost like a bit of a callback to that opening sequence with Jackie where you're just getting into all sorts of trouble. He's shooting guns out the yes, side. And yes. now we can kind of emulate that in like open play, which is yep, yep, really yep. exciting. Also in some of the early trailers, you can open the vehicle side doors. Yeah. And then, you know, you can just do that kind of like you know, fishtail or whatever, uh, and pull out your gun. Be yes. I can't wait to see the YouTube videos. Now, certainly we've got a, uh, a friendly kind of a targeting system, but we all, you also can free aim and start hitting tires and gas tanks and blowing them up and really getting that sort of skill level with it. So I look forward to seeing some people pull that off. That's so cool. It's all just kind of speaking to the creativity that you want players to have in Night nice City, because yeah. you said you put some life into it, and now we're giving you all the tools to just do whatever you want to do there as well. You got it, you got it. It's great. Now, we've heard this expansion was built as more of a standalone experience. So how does it kind of link in with the existing narrative with V, Johnny? What's actually going on in Phantom Liberty? So we got to be careful with saying standalone because it is actually part of the main base game storyline. Oh. It's in the midst of it. Though, if you want to come in and play just this, we give you the option to skip ahead to it. Oh, amazing. Start immediately with Phantom Liberty. And you can, you can leave Dogtown, you can go on to other quests, you can stick just to the Phantom Liberty quest line. And of course, when you finish it, there will be like an end sequence or various end sequences, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, um, and you can continue on with the base game. So it's in the midst of it. Similar to some of the Witcher expansions, similar yeah. to some of how we did some of that stuff, but a little bit more um, even free here because you can go back and forth between the game. I won't take up too much more of your time. I just want to know one thing. When and how can players get their hands on Phantom Liberty? September 26th on Xbox Series S and X. Oh, close. Damn. Gabe, thanks so much for your time. Back to you guys for more games right here at Gamescom. Good evening, 47. Your target is Alexius Lascaris, known to his more sycophantic followers as the Drop. He initially established himself as a DJ, but realized it would be easy and lucrative to exploit his connections in the world of EDM as a drug kingpin instead. His empire of music venues has become inextricable from his trafficking network. Our client is a successful DJ who's understandably nervous about Lascaris' expansion. Good luck. both alien and intoxicated to earth realmers while our realms are at peace there are outworlders who would prefer us to be at war general shah victor of the tavarian war conqueror of the quatan plains all of outworld is grateful for his service <laughs> You would consign us to endless war. Better that than be Liu Kang's lapdog. Did not your illustrious father teach you that war is the last resort? Do not forget that, General. Gather once again to honor my late husband's legacy, to continue the tournament that he founded with Lord Liu Kang. Empress Sindel. Let us meet your champion. Earthrealm's champion is Raiden, your majesty. <laughs> is it me, or is Earthrealm's champion scrawnier than usual? He has earned his place by embodying the very best qualities of Earthrealm's people. I am ready, Your Majesty. Whom shall I face? We will destroy your champion.
champion Liu Kang. He will taste no victory. Your queen. I'm Chris Osaki, creative director for Forza Motorsport. We are bringing new racing dynamics, visual fidelity, and gameplay detail to every track. This includes weather, 24-hour day-night cycles, and track evolution. More tracks are coming to Forza Motorsport after our launch on October 10th, including past favorites and brand new challenges to keep the competition fresh and exciting. We can't wait to share more. See you at the starting line. And just like that, a new track for Forza Motorsport is born. And how appropriate as well that it be the famous Nürburgring GP just a hop, a skip and a jump from where I'm standing right now. The track and those new cars we just saw are coming day one when Forza Motorsport launches on Xbox and PC Game Pass. Now, you've maybe noticed the amazing custom wrapped Porsche take on on the floor as well as the six custom Xbox Series X consoles. That is all to celebrate Porsche's 75th anniversary. And in fact, you at home have a chance to win one of those ultra limited custom consoles. You could take home the Pink Pig Xbox Series X inspired by the iconic 1971 Porsche livery of the same name simply by typing exclamation mark Porsche in Twitch chat right now. That's exclamation point capital P Porsche right in chat. Back here at the booth, however, fans also have a chance to experience the Builders' Cup with a group of super fast German sedans on Spa. And in case you missed it, more information on wheel support for both Xbox and PC has been shared. To learn more, you can check out Forza.net. And if you are on Steam, pre-orders are now open. So strap in and start your engines. The new Forza Motorsport speeds onto Xbox and PC Game Pass October 10th. And if you just can't wait that long, and my dudes, I don't blame you, check out the premium edition or premium add-ons bundle of the game to get early access starting October 5th. That Forza Motorsport Premium Edition, by the way, includes the full game, race day car pack, car pass, VIP membership, and welcome pack. So much to look forward to. But now, a sequel that already has a cult following and a release that we are all waiting for. We are so excited it's here to play at the Xbox booth. Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl brings fans into a unique survival experience in the post apocalyptic Chernobyl exclusion zone. But what does the zone hold for Stalker fans everywhere? Hmm. Maybe we should check out this never seen before gameplay from this one of a kind shooter, sim, and horror title. This is Stalker 2.
I was attacked while on a job. I got hit in the head, and when I woke up, I was in almost nothing but my birthday suit. to Herman. Over and out. Now, I think it's time for another Twitch chat giveaway. So all you need to do is type exclamation mark day one for your chance to win a month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. That's exclamation mark day one. Good luck, everyone. And while you're busy entering the giveaway, I think it's a great time to also get out your climbing rope and make sure your blast is strapped in tight as we journey up the tower in Jusson. Joining me on this meditative climb, please welcome Jusson co-game directors, Kevin and Mathieu. How are you guys today? It's great yeah, to have you. Yeah, we're fine. Thanks for welcoming Thank us. Awesome. I'm so excited as a big fan of Life is Strange and also Vampire to have you guys here from Don't Not Entertainment. So thanks. thanks for coming to play. Okay. So shall we jump right into the game? Yeah, sure. I Matt. can't wait to see. Now, straight away, I do notice we've got some a little watermark down in the corner here as well. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, for the it's, uh, it's yeah, it's uh, it's a marker. It's a sign uh, because it's actually exclusive content. Hey. So, uh, yeah. So we are showing off like today because it's a special event, but it won't be in the game in the end. So don't worry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be here when you play. <laughs> no watermark. Excellent news. So just on. Could you tell me what that means for the yeah. game title? Yeah, of course. So, uh, Jusson is a French word. It's actually a maritime term that we use to uh, to explain the period of time of receding tide. Actually, you guys in English, you have ebb, E-B-B, but we prefer the sound of French words better. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound good. Yeah, yeah. Ebb and flow. I like that phrase a lot, but, you know, I don't really use it in everyday life, yeah. but Jusson sounds uh, a lot nicer too. <laughs> But it also means something from our game because, mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, people who are listening to us already played the demo. They uh, they probably witnessed the fact that the ocean of the world has gone, and it's actually a uh, permanent receding tide. So ah, very good. That's so interesting. So it affects sort of the setting and the story behind it as well. Yeah. Nice. Now, speaking of the demo and also the trailer you guys showed not too long ago at the Xbox Game Showcase, yeah. we saw some uh, pretty interesting looking game mechanics like this rope here. Here to tell us all. Yeah, of the... course. <laughs> so, obviously, everybody can witness the fact that our main mechanic is timing, but we also have a couple of tools to help us, to help us do so. Mm -hmm. You have a rope, uh, you have what we call the pythons, you have three of them. You have the stamina that you can see on the yeah, the green gauge here. Oh yeah. And um, and actually, we the level design behind it is that every wall that you climb has been thought over as a puzzle. So you need to use those tools to overcome the puzzle and mm. find the solution. And on the second part, you have this little blue guy here on the shoulder. Look at him! Yay! Oh, Ballast. So cute. Is so, he quite size close there as well? <laughs> So he's going to help us uh, climbing as well because uh -huh. he also features abilities like uh, Echo. Matt will show that later on. Uh -huh. And what he just did is like some kind of a sonar that gives you hints of uh -huh. some narrative elements that we scattered through the world. Okay. So yeah. 
also kind of like uh, secrets or, or Easter eggs to find and stuff like that? Or uh, Easter eggs, I mean, you'll need to roam the, 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 the game to find some if For you want. Sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we scattered a lot of stuff nice. uh, to tell, tell more about the lore and the, about the stories as well. Okay. So if you're an explorer, then you'll be able to right now. Nice. I love Almost. Yeah, oh, it's, like a, a it's actually made of water. I didn't oh, okay. precise. Yeah, I didn't say that. It's actually made of water. It's the only water in the world mm. right now, and that served the purpose of the message that we are trying to tell through Juson. Okay, How very interesting. So, for example, if I can jump in here, sure. it's actually exclusive stuff that we have in this specific biome. You are those pebbles that Matthew is climbing on. Mm. Uh, it's actually a living thing that you oh, can yeah. use to climb. And the echo of the ballast can actually, you know, have an effect on that, and among other things. Wow! So it seems you've got a lot of help climbing this yeah, tower yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. It's not just about the rope, maybe then. As no, well. no, it's um, through the mechanics, through the gameplay. Mm -hmm. We are trying to to tell something about uh, helping each other because, of course, uh, our main character couldn't climb without the ballast, and the ballast couldn't climb without the main character. Yeah. So it's all about, you know, a fable about helping each other. How should we coexist together mm -hmm. instead of, you know, not doing so? And how we can move forward or upward, in our case, <laughs> uh, uh, in life. Yeah. So that's the part of the message of Juzon. That's very beautiful. Thank you. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yes, like absolutely. <laughs> um, now, I'd love to learn a bit more about the rope as well, because we've gone up a few different levels. You've used ladders, mature, as well as the rope, and I've seen it change color a few times. Yes. So. Um, as a feedback, we uh, just to make sure that the players understand, the rope has a length limit. Mm. And so to make sure that everybody knows uh, what uh, what lengths they have already unrolled, the, the rope changes of color. So when it's blue, it's fine. When mm -hmm. it's yellow, you actually need to be monitoring what you're doing. And when it's getting red, it's because you're approaching the, the, the limit length. I see. That's yeah. really interesting. I love these flowers that we're seeing. As yeah, well. you can climb on. So oh. this is one of the effects of the eco I was you know, talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the features that is also interesting for us, narratively speaking and gameplay-wise, because as you awaken the, the living thing and the nature in the game to help you climb, and so in gameplay, you mm -hmm. also uh, awaken it to, uh, to awaken the tower. And besides being made of water, the, uh, the ballast mm -hmm. is actually the only thing here that shares the bond with the tower and with the nature. So mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, representing symboli it's, it's like a symbolism about the, the link the, with the nature, the, the relationship with the nature that we kind of have lost so far. Yeah, that's so interesting as well. Chat, I hope you're all uh, enjoying some Jusson gameplay as well. I'd love to see some opinions as well. This is so exciting that this is going to be coming to Xbox Game Pass as well. Yes, yes. Um, day one too. So if you fancy winning some um, Game Pass to play Jusson, then exclamation mark day one. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> so now we are approaching a very tricky area because, okay. uh, yeah, if you're afraid of eight, of eight then mm. don't look down. <laughs> or maybe you should look down for the people, <laughs> Matt. So Matthew's not afraid. The tools we were talking about earlier, the, mm. the, the fun that is that you need to combine them to overcome the challenges that we're talking about. So here, you swing over, and then you can wall run. You can use the pebbles, but if you don't want to, then it's your choice. You can do otherwise. Yeah. Uh, you can go on the left with, our, with your rope, and now you can throw an eco to go up again. It's actually very free. We try to, through our gameplay, we try to give the possibility for players to uh, actually climb at their own pace. Um, it's you're designing your own flow, so yeah. it's up to you how you want to climb. And one, sh one thing that we made sure of is you can't die. And the rope is actually 
creating some kind of bound between you and the tower. Okay. And without the rope, you can't climb, but without... Um, I mean, if you fall, it will hold you back, so cool. you can't die. So you can't die in Juzon. It's actually not very necessary. And for us, because we wanted to create some kind of med med meditative vibe, uh -huh. uh, the desk was not part of the design. That's lovely. And then you've just reattached the rope yes. to the next like, checkpoint. One thing that we can mention here is um, what Mathieu did is what we call a relay. It's actually a term that you can use also in climbing. Mm -hmm. People are creating a relay to you know, help other people when they are climbing high. And we use, the, um, we use the feature in our game to actually give you the possibility to fully recharge your stamina when actually before that you need to be fit on the ground to do so. Mm -hmm. So it's actually making you climb longer and it's actually also creating some kind of checkpoints nice. that you make sure that you won't fall anymore. Yeah. And you can also use, like it did, the, the rope as a grapple. Mm -hmm. It's using, it's, it's, yeah, you can use it as a magnet so you can grapple where you see this kind of stuff. Very versatile then. I'm curious, do you guys climb yourself then? If you, uh, there's a lot of thought <laughs> not, in here. Not right? really, but well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, yeah? Yeah, yeah you do just, some in just the research. One, two years. Uh, just just at the beginning of the process. Of that. Like nice. a, two, one year ago, maybe two years ago, we, we started to climb, yeah. but uh, yeah, not professionals, definitely. <laughs> definitely yeah. Just not. for fun. That's cool. So yeah, you mentioned just then about using like the pebbles, the um, yeah, that are alive as well as you're climbing up the plants and stuff, and the environments look really beautiful as well as, I guess, different ways to solve each of the puzzles yes. that you're talking about too. And also, what we try to do is, since we are telling the story of a bygone civilization, mm. the every props or every object that you use to climb was actually used by the people before. So, oh, okay. yeah, so that's why you use the rope so much because we try to tell a story about a vertical society, a vertical life, mm -hmm. and everything was made to make sure that people are able to climb. So you're just using that back and, uh, and it's a way to, yeah, to move upwards and downwards. Nice. And now Mati is going to show us how he can dance among the peoples <laughs> because you have, we designed this particular wall made fully of pebbles so ah. you need to play with your rope with your pythons you need to use everything you have in hands yeah. to make sure you you overcome the, the wall and finish that oh gosh look how cute i'm obsessed with how cute everything is yeah. in this game already and i don't know if people notice but if we yeah so if you use the echo mm -hmm. people stop for a moment so that gives you the opportunity to ah, okay. kind of pause the game uh, and, uh, you know, relax, observe where yeah. you can go and go back hanging yeah. again. Make your next move, figure yes, out absolutely. your next move stuff. That's so cool. So the different, I guess, little puzzles or environment sections, can you choose different ways to climb up? Yes, like, you can. Is there and multiple? Yeah, yeah, you definitely can. And we have different biomes. This is the second one. People had the chance to play to the first one in the, mm -hmm. in the public demo. And we have others. And each biome has specificities. The environment will uh, will change, and this is how we bring gameplay variations into our game. So, I hope that guys are excited to see what's next. Yeah. What are the biomes made of? For sure. I'm really excited more about the um, your ballast abilities too. So, maybe you can speak about it just now. I won't push you, but it would be really cool to see if there's like new abilities and how that affects the rest of the Yeah, actually well. we saw a kind of everything because um, our, uh, what we tried to do is give all the players at the beginning all the tools they needed and then you need to stick with it and as designer, as developers, we bring the variation through the environment because the, it's actually a kind of a short game, so mm -hmm. having upgrades or whatever, it wouldn't have made sense. Besides, with the message that we are trying to tell, it didn't fit in the mood, since yeah. we are trying to bring a meditative vibe, you know, a chill chill game, chill out game. Sure. Upgrading like other games do, it wasn't our cup of tea. So it's better to have few tools that you have from the beginning, and then you, are, you have time to master them, you have time to get used to it, and then we are here to trick you into some habits. 
<laughs> and yeah. Oh, I love that. It does. It feels so peaceful already as well. So this is um, one tower that we're climbing up just now. Is there like different sides that we could explore? Is that quite a key element to the yeah, game as well? We have few secondary paths uh, mm. where you find more about the lore and uh, the story. Uh, but it's not an open world game, so you know, it's fine. Yeah. But we we worked really hard on the vistas and make sure that people had the time to enjoy the environment we were designing. Also, mm -hmm. what Matt did is something that we like to do ourselves is, you know, looking back, realize how much you have climbed and how much is left as well. And uh, we hope that guys will be enjoying as well. Okay. Yeah. So there's like some time elements as well as this maritime theme of water coming and going then as well? Something uh, like that? Not about water, you said? Sorry. Like the time that you're saying, you can look back at, I guess, the oh, progress yeah. you've made and stuff, as well as like the water leaving and things. Yeah, yeah, we, you can find traces of this. Mm -hmm. so. Nice. And um, for the people, I hope they also enjoy the music uh -huh. because uh, we worked very really hard with a French composer uh, called Guillaume Ferrand. If he's watching us, I say, hey, Guillaume. Mm -hmm. And um, and he actually understood very well how, uh, what were our intentions, mm -hmm. uh, what we were trying to tell, what story is behind it, and he, he yeah, he composed very beautiful okay. uh, music and OST. So yeah, so sound of music is quite an important yes. element to the setting, like yeah, and stuff. because it set up the mood mm -hmm. as well. Is uh, when you're playing, you're hearing like a, a nice piano music. It helps bring the uh, the chill out. Uh, experience, right? Amazing. It yeah. does. I'm so chilled already just playing Thank with you, you guys today. Do you know, I cannot wait to play some Jusson as well. I hope chat feel the same way as well. I hope so. <laughs> Kevin Mathieu, thank you so much for showing us yeah, thank some you. Jusson today. That's been thank so good. Us. Thank you for having us. No worries. I have one last question for you of guys course. and that would be when can we play it then? <laughs> Actually, the game will be released on the 31 of October. Wow. Yeah, so uh, you can pre-order it uh, right after now, I guess. Hey! Yes. How so, exciting! There we yes. go! So I hope, uh, don't hesitate to press the button. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, two months from now. Two months from now. Yeah. I can't wait. Guys, thank you so thank much Thank you for again. having us. Awesome. Next up, we're venturing back into the dark place with Alan Wake 2. But first, here's just one more look at Jason.
It's the game that made fans everywhere jump more than a few times and showcased its own unique horror episodic style. Here to show us what Alan Wake has been up to these last 13 years are two of the minds behind its sequel from Remedy Games, writer and creative director Sam Lake and game director Kyle Rowley. Welcome to you both. First off, how are you? Are you well? Thank you. Thank you. Great Gamescom. Yeah, yeah. Very happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, given that Alan Wake's journey mm -hmm. began with Xbox. There and we Microsoft. go, back on the green carpet, yes. chatting so, about it again. <laughs> feels feels proper to it be here. It feels correct, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, wonderful. Right, well, what we're going to be talking, we're actually going to be having some gameplay on in the background for Twitch chat to have a look at. It's going to be some new ad Gamescom footage we're going to be going through. So while that's on, I'd love to talk a little bit more about some of the new elements that fans can expect to see in Alan Wake 2. Sam, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to I mean, about it is a sequel, but also, given that it comes out 13 years after the first game, yep. there are plenty of new elements. Uh, Let's we, go through them all, one uh, by one. <laughs> we, we really felt that we want to create a modern experience, and, and we could not have done yes. this game. Uh, no. We have been Who is this? building Who is concepts this? of Alan Wake 2 through all of these years. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not like you picked it up last week and decided to do something <laughs> with it. <laughs> but this one, we could not have made before building Control first, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which was our previous game. A lot of learnings with each project yep. that, that we were able to then bring into this one. Mm -hmm. uh, elements like hub-like design for the environments, the whole game genre being a horror game now, a uh, lot, lot more ambition on interactive storytelling mm -hmm. in this and the concept of remedy connected universe yeah. which we established with control so yeah. control and alan wake belong into the same world mm -hmm. and there are connection points and crossover elements in it oh how exciting um i also want to touch very slightly on the name itself because alan wake 2 yeah, it's a sequel but the name is very fitting and because as i say not only is it a sequel but you play as two characters so i was wondering who wants to tell me about saga and how their story intertwines with alan yeah there there are a lot of tools in, in yeah, this experience yeah. <laughs> two playable characters it's a it's with, a recurring theme as yes two. yes the, the, uh, Alan Wake, of course, but then our new Remedy Hero character, FBI agent Saga Anderson, mm -hmm. who comes in and, and, and the player with her comes into this experience playing Saga. She is a newcomer mm -hmm. to this supernatural world mm -hmm. of Alan Wake. Yeah. She knows nothing before. She's a profiler, FBI agent, comes in to uh, investigate these ritualistic murders oh, yeah. in the Pacific Northwest. Uh -huh. And then it starts to spiral out of control from there. <laughs> uh, so we have two worlds, yep. essentially. We have the Pacific Northwest. We have three separate hub areas. Bright, the small town of Bright Falls, uh, the majestic Cauldron Lake, this Caldera Lake, mm -hmm. and the surrounding forests, mm -hmm. and then the neighboring town of Watery. And you get to explore all of these hub areas. I love that you were describing them as these beautiful places to yes. go check out. They're well, going to be horrific naturally, it, right? <laughs> it, it's a wonderful place to go on a vacation. <laughs> I don't yes. think you're telling me the <laughs> truth at all. <laughs> I think we had a, in the Art Direction Bible, we said terrifyingly beautiful was one of the things that we were yes. kind of like talking well, about. Well, once again, kind of yeah. two extremes yeah. coming together. The juxtaposition of it. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Like they're like us on stage. Exactly. Right now. I mean, you're yes. doing it well, right yeah. now. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I feel like I should have an eye on All carefully consistent. <laughs> the theme that runs yes. through the whole of uh, our lives, I think. <laughs> but yeah, like, like a lot of uh, a lot of duality, light and darkness, yep. obviously, at the very core of Alan Wake experience. Mm -hmm. You use light as safety and as a weapon, and, and the supernatural darkness is your enemy. But then you go on a journey uh, playing Saga uh, on this murder investigation, but you are also playing as Alan Wake trapped in the nightmare dimension of the dark place that takes the shape of this nightmarish New York City this time around. Yeah. And, and that's one big hub of its own where we are unlocking new uh, areas for you to explore as you progress. Mm -hmm. so, so these exist side by side yeah. and you are able to choose and hop between them 
uh, as you want uh, going through this experience. And you're not just knowledgeable as the creative director, I guess, Sam, but you're in the game as well, right? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you are a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I, like, it's teamwork and it's collaboration more than anything, as always video games, making video games is, but one thing to make this game so long and it's 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 kind of very special to me i just felt that i want to go all in yeah so so we are so was it you that stepped forward and said can i be in the game please <laughs> <laughs> we are co-directing with kyle uh i'm co-writing the story and the screenplay and yes i'm 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 acting as alex casey mm -hmm. who is saga's fbi partner but also a fictional character that Alan Wake used to write about for oh, years and years. Oh, very smart. And yeah. and uh, but I'm doing half of the performance really. I'm I'm the physical actor. You're just actor doing one arm and a leg. And 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 <laughs> and yes, yeah. exactly. And the hair. And, and and the wonderful, wonderful James McCaffrey uh -huh. is is the voice of, of oh, Alex Case. Nice. Okay, we yep. can see how that plays out. I don't know if you've had a moment though. I keep looking in chat, and chat is absolutely so excited for this game. Uh, <laughs> Sweet Tooth, they're saying almost as beautiful as me. Sweet Tooth, I bet you're gorgeous. <laughs> Are you as gorgeous as Alan Wake? Then I don't know. Um, the next question I want to ask, completely distracted there, sorry, is I want to know more. You mentioned more about um, the horror element that you're leaning into, and Remedy have really gone into this not just survival game, but a survival horror game. What does that over mean? Over to you. Hi. Yeah, over, over to me. Um, yeah, I mean, that all started from us looking back at, um, you know, Alan Wake 1, uh -huh. uh, what we as the team kind of really liked about Alan, Alan Wake 1. <laughs> I'm so, so distracted. Yeah, he's, just, he's just loving his <laughs> coffee or whatever he's drinking in there. Uh, yeah, so we're looking back at Alan Wake 1 and, you know, what did we like? What did we think we could improve upon? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we kind of like came to a conclusion of quite quickly was that, you know, we we just come off making Max Payne when we did Iron Wake 1, so we're kind of very good uh -huh. at making this kind of like fast-paced action gameplay. But the story we were telling was a bit more on, you know, uh, psychological horror style. So for this one, we really wanted to make sure that those, those two elements, the story and the gameplay, were kind of really connected, so creating a more cohesive experience. Um, so that kind of led us into the idea of, okay, why don't we make this like a, a survival horror game? And, and instantly when we were talking about that, we were like, wait a minute, what, we should have done this thing to begin with. Yeah. You were scared before, wait until this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, survival horror, I think, with the type of stories that we like to tell and, you know, the skills that we feel like we're very good at as a studio, like, build, like world building and building a sense of place and atmosphere. Um, I think that like the, the horror genre in general, just we, we, we feel like that that's a kind of perfect fit for us as a studio. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on top of that, 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 you know, that genre as a whole, it kind of allows us to kind of slow the gameplay down. We can focus more on the world. We can focus more on the environments and the environmental storytelling. Um, and then we can use kind of like the atmosphere to kind of build a sense of dread or a sense of threat as you're kind of progressing through the game. So for us, it just felt like a really natural fit. Um, and then, you know, I think that fight with light that kind of Sam was talking about before, you know, light versus darkness, mm -hmm. those kind of core themes just fit inside the horror genre very well. And, you know, from a gameplay perspective, we tried to, you know, it's still a sequel to the first game which, which we made. So we still wanted to keep that, you know, fight with light concept in there. Yeah. It just, but we've slowed the gameplay down a bit more. Enemies are more threatening. They have more presence. Uh, there's less of them. You're fighting less of them throughout the course of the game. Uh, but yeah, it just felt like a very nice fit. I like the way there's lots of, you say there's lots of different elements playing this. You mentioned before the control connection with the universe as well. Is there anything more you can share with that universe connection and how they play together? Yeah, the, the way we are approaching games now with Remedy Connected Universe is that it is very, very important for us to create, like each game is a world of its own. Like these are big, big things. So, so we feel it needs to be approachable. Uh, to everybody, not just Remedy ex sure. fans. Yeah, not and, just and, the mega nerds. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which, which is, we we absolutely love that. Oh, we be love a mega nerd. Be don't get me wrong. Because we we, <laughs> we are the same way ourselves, <laughs> and and but but at the same time, it, it shouldn't feel like oh homework. Yes, I need to play the first course. game. Yeah. I need to play Control. You don't, and 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 that that is part of the reason why. Saga is such a perfect new hero character. She doesn't know anything when she comes into this, mm -hmm. and she is learning, and the player is learning. Sure. However, mm. them, like yeah. under the surface, 
it is very layered and very deep and and well, there are you know you know kind of things there, but it's, there is have to know a ton of that stuff yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a ton to be discovered yeah. a ton of connection points and 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 taking certain threads further uh -huh. uh, in in the universe so yeah all right okay Ch i'm challenging you to find them all um uh -huh. So I've got to be finding them already. Like, yeah, they probably are watching yeah. now. You know what they're like. Um, I have to be totally honest as well. Uh, we've been sat around the back, hanging out during the show, speaking to all the different guests. Aaron Greenberg came by and would not stop talking about how impressed he was with the demo that he saw, and we saw you on his Instagram. So as well as the time you spent with Aaron, I'd love to know what's the reaction been like from opening night live and your Gamescom so far. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Good, like and, that. Yeah, and and, and it's. <laughs> It's always so important. Like, like we are not done yet. Uh, we well, are on the final, <laughs> final stretch. We are on final stretch, <laughs> and there is a ton of work, as there always is. So, back home, the wonderful, talented Remedy team is working on this. And and but you know, when you keep working on a project like this for years, you you start to be blind to it yes. and, and second guessing yourself and being uncertain. So, so it's really, really important for us to be able to come here, show material, get reactions. Mm -hmm. And especially when it's very, very positive reactions, yeah, it's a big energy boost uh, to everybody working on the game and, and uh, very, very important. I imagine it makes yeah. you decide to get the plane back so you can go finish it and do a bit more like, yeah, go on then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've got we've still got some work to done. Yeah, to be done, yeah. but uh, we we do. Yes. Perfect. Well, that leads me perfectly onto my very final question, and that is: When does everyone at home need to mark their calendars? When does Alan Wake Two release? Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Alan, <laughs> you look at me. Alan, <laughs> Alan Wake Two comes out on October twenty seventh. Uh, so, not long to go. Not Get long at all. October continues to be. Oh, okay. Very, very busy. Cheers to that. Thank you both, Sam and Kyle, for joining me today. Uh, Alan Wake 2 looks horrifically delightful, I think, was the, the summation of it. But later on in the show, we're going to catch up with a man who erased his name from Like a Dragon Gaiden. Then the crew from Elder Scrolls Online joins us to talk combat and community. Plus, it's time for another giveaway. Enter exclamation mark day one in the Twitch chat right now for your chance to win a month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. And remember, that is exclamation mark day one. Next up, though, it's a world in crisis and fans somehow just can't get enough of it. Citizen Sleeper 2 Starward Vector brings fans back to the Starward belt, but this time's are, it's a little bit less than optimal, let's say that. Check out more from this behind the scenes of this space age adventure. Take a look. Wake up, sleeper. Hi, I'm Gareth Damian Martin, developer of Citizen Sleeper. We've had an incredible first year on Game Pass, and I want to thank everyone who's played, shared, streamed, reviewed the game. Thank you so much. And if you didn't take a journey to Erlen's Eye to play our unique RPG, well, I have some good news for you. Citizen Sleeper is going to be sticking around on Game Pass, and that's because Citizen Sleeper 2 Starward Vector will be coming to Game Pass day one on release. Wake up, sleeper. No, 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 get out! They haven't finished it! Oh, Sleeper's finished, aren't you? We had a deal, Sleeper. And yet, here you are, risking it all to try and break our contract to end your dependence. Just wanted to use them, you piece of shit! Nothing wrong with being a tool in a time of crisis. Uh, there's a war on, and while it rages, well, there's opportunity. I thought you were an opportunity sleeper, desperate, on the run, a hard worker with certain needs. I met your needs. I gave you a crew, lent you a ship, even hooked you up with a contract or two. And, and yes, I took my share, but that only seems fair. I invested in you. But then you went and did this. And now, you don't need this. And I don't need you anymore either. Sleeper, go! Now! To the ship!
you can expect the same freeform tabletop RPG inspired dice based gameplay with slice of life stories and relatable characters. But this time you'll have a ship, build a crew and take on contracts as you explore the Starward Belt, trying to make ends meet. It's bigger, more varied, more challenging than the original, but with the same deep world building and freeform gameplay. It's my attempt to capture what's special about stories like Cowboy Bebop and Firefly, where it's not about hauling tons of titanium across the galaxy, but it's about getting into trouble with a complex cast of characters, improvising, making do, and always running on the edge of disaster. We'll be revealing more soon, but before I go, I wanted to offer Game Pass players a world-exclusive first look at one of the locations from the game. Welcome to Hexport. This bustling way station is built on the back of three vast abandoned solar reflectors. Taking advantage of the flow of power from these pre-collapsed corporate artifacts, the port is rich with industry and activity. The Benz is a spacer bar where you can find trouble and freelance crew in equal measure. The exchange is the thrumming heart of the station filled with data brokers and merchants, the perfect place to land a lucrative contract. Factory Row is filled with ship fitters and salvage yards, a tight-knit community you'll need to get on the right side of if you want repairs. Arriving in Hexport with a crippled ship, you'll need to learn to navigate the station, find allies and go out on contracts if you hope to stay one step ahead of Lane. I can't wait to show you more, and I want to thank you all again for making this sequel possible by supporting and playing the first game. And if you haven't played Citizen Sleeper, well, now's the perfect time to play it on Game Pass with three DLC episodes just waiting for you. Turn your eyes starward, and I'll see you in the belt. This, <laughs> this is just the beginning, Sleeper. So welcome to the Xbox booth tour at Gamescom. I'm gonna do my best to try and show you as much of the 45,000 square feet of the booth, which is the largest we've ever had at Gamescom in history. There's 150 gaming stations, tons of games, and we're kicking off with the Cyberpunk 2077 queue, which is like over two hours long. We've also got Antstream here, which includes 1,000 300 games. It's the largest gaming drop in one go in Xbox history. You can also pick up a lifetime subscription for that for a short time. So go check that out. Um, it's definitely worth it. But we're going to go try and take you through. There's so many people here. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to kind of make sure that we can show you as much of the booth. Now, as we're kind of heading around the Cyberpunk 2077 line, people have got their chairs out just to kind of help them out with the queue times. But one of my favorite areas, which is that he was a little Easter egg for the next part of the booth. We have, if you've been playing Diablo 4, an actual statue of Lilith. Now, this is a great photo opportunity, which are dotted throughout the booth. Um, as you know, we're going through the outskirts of it right now because it's the fastest way to get around because there are thousands of people within the booth. But right here, We've got the statue of Lilith from Diablo 4. People are able to take their photo with it. It's got like blood pouring down from the skull above and then, then email it to themselves from there. Now, we're gonna keep on moving through. Every part of the booth, you've got gaming stations like here. We've got Armored Core, uh, which people are able to hop on and play. Uh, the demo for that is actually really awesome. I had a lot of fun with that last night at FanFest. Um, we head through the right hand side if you have a look at the main show floor you can see the xbox stage where we've been doing the whole broadcast from so we've had phil spencer up there yesterday with charlie which is one of my favorite interviews of the show so far and also potentially one of my dream cars for forza motorsport the porsche taycan and one of the great things with this there are actually loads of scratches like you won't be able to see it like from like without getting up close but this was actually in a real race like a couple of weeks ago. So there's a few scratches from that. More photo opportunities for people to get involved in. So if you think, you know, you got top of the podium, you can go there if you're the fastest racer because we've got some demos of Forza Motorsport behind closed doors, which is really cool to see. And this next stop might be one of the more anticipated areas, like one of the most anticipated games. We've got Senua's Saga Hellblade 2, and people are able to uh, get some like face paint to make themselves look like the characters within the game, which is pretty cool. I'll probably come and do that a little bit later. So if I pop up on the stream, looking a little bit different, you know why. Uh, we've got Payday 3. Now, we've got this on the show later in the week as well. And as an FPS fan, 
really, really excited. It's always a good laugh to play with a few of your friends as well. We've got Charlie's best friend from Elder Scrolls Online. It's huge, absolutely huge. And it's one of the big things. It's not just the booth that's huge. The things within the booth are massive. We've got our history untold on the right here. Now, if you've ever been to Gamescom in the past, you'll notice, like, usually in this hall, the Xbox booth is just this side. We're walking straight through the middle, and it's like doubled from like a couple years ago. Now, if we continue fighting our way through the pack here, on the left-hand side, we've got Towerborn, which we'll, we'll get to in just a little minute. Now, as we're walking through, you'll be able to see the Starfield Theatre. It's uh, been one of the most popular areas on the booth because it's the opportunity for you to go and see the, first, like the start of Starfield, like around the first 20 minutes of the game. We had Todd Howard there yesterday, which was very, very cool. Now, on the right-hand side, we've got the opportunity to go and play Stalker 2, and there's like a whole load of more photo opportunities and things for you to check out along there. Party animals, now hopefully, oh my God, I think they're there. Maybe my favorite thing, like if, if, I don't know why, but they are so adorable and I think they are here. Or am I seeing things? No, I think I'm seeing things. No, they're not here. They're, this is maybe one of the saddest things. So throughout the week, we've been having life-sized party animals. I'm going to try and get them to throw it up on screen. But they're so adorably cute. Sadly, they're not here, uh, but that's all good. Stalker 2 is here on our right-hand side. We've got the Starfield Theatre. And I'm, I just hope that you're starting to kind of get the, the idea of the scale of the booth here at Gamescom. But let's head straight over this way. Now, Age of Empires 4, you can play it right now if you want to on controller or on your Xbox console. We've got an awesome console here as well. Just kind of, you know, commemorate the game as well. So if you, if you like it, I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain that it's a very nice gold. I never trust myself when it comes to colors because I'm colorblind, but it's all good. Now, the next thing I want to show you is, of course, if we head to the side of the Xbox stage, we've got a very unique Starfield experience which was designed for Gamescom with Temper. And if you look to the right, you can actually see a life-sized cockpit which has got unique footage which has not been seen anywhere else, purposely built for that chair, which is insane. I'd recommend checking it out if you're at Gamescom, uh, but I kind of want the chair myself. It is very, very cool. Now, also, you have to have the opportunity to win stuff on the booth, which is right here in front of the stage. You'll see people queuing up, hitting the button for their chance to win a whole ton of prizes from the booth on the left-hand side. Other game titles, like this guy right here, just won a lanyard. All right, PC Game Pass lanyard. You, I've seen people winning Ultimate Game, Xbox Game Pass, uh, headsets, loads of cool prizes over there. Now, if we make our way to the right, We've got the queue over here for Flight Sim. They've got like yokes. They've got loads of different ways to play the game, uh, which is a cool experience. So if you've not had the opportunity to play on like a flight stick, this might be your chance to do so. And the final stop that I want to show you all is of course, Towerborn. Now, the one thing that I'm very excited about with Towerborn is we've got a really cool demo coming to the show tomorrow. So I wanna make sure that you hit that follow button so you don't miss that. And that's the end of the Xbox booth tour. So don't miss that show tomorrow. And I'm gonna go play some more games. I'll see you later. It's time to start chatting about the ultimate brawling combat in the intensely immersive world of Yakuza. It's a world in which Kazuma Kiryu was supposed to be rid of with Yakuza 6, but as we're about to see, drama finds even those who hide from it. Joining me to show off Like a Dragon Gate and the man who erased his name, please welcome Hideyuki Sakamoto, Sakamoto-san and our interpreter Gavin Green. Thanks so much for joining us today. So we're going to jump right into the demo we have here on stage. And our first question I want to ask is for folks trying to pinpoint where we are in the franchise timetable and lore, what is it that we're looking at? え、でも最初から
どういったこう表舞台から姿を消してこう生きていたかっていったところが語られるような物語になってましてこれが後の「龍河如くセブン」あとは「龍河如くエイトにつながるまでのいきさつをあのこう作られたようなゲームになっています。So, like a Dragon Gaiden, the man who erased his name talks about、um, the story of Kazuma Kiryu at the end of Yakuza 6. So, he kind of disappeared from the scene, right? And this game is going to explore the story of what he was doing behind the scenes from the end of Yakuza 6 to the start of、uh, Like a Dragon. Infinite Wealth. Ah, amazing, wonderful, thank you. So, we've also heard that this game is more compact than some of the other games in the series. So, what can fans expect from side quests, overall gameplay, and please let me know if karaoke is coming back. このゲーム、他のゲームと違って、もうちょっとこじんまりということを聞いたんですが、あのどんなことを期待できますかあの、結構オープンワールドもありますでしょうし、あでしょうか、またミニゲームとか、えー、とカラオケもありますかあのまあ、今回の「セブンガイデンは」は、まあ、メインの舞台は蒼天堀っていう、まあ、いわゆる大阪の舞台とあの、まあ、こちらのデモでもあのお見せしているキャッスルという、まあ、いろんなこう特殊な舞台といったものが用意されているんですけれども、まあ、ストーリー、サブストーリープレイスポットといったような数に関しては、まあ、従来通りのナンバリングと、まあ、同様に楽しめる内容になっていると思います。So, this game contains like, all of the things that you're, away- that you're familiar with from the series. It's got story, main story, it's got side stories, it's got mini games. So, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the kind of construction of the main games. And it takes place mostly in Soten Mori, but also is,、uh, as you see in this demo, it takes place in the castle as well. Ooh, how interesting. Okay, so a question I'm going to ask on behalf of Kiryu, as I'm certain he's asking it multiple times, is why can't he just be left alone? Hasn't he been through enough? あのこれキリを代表にしてあのこれ聞くんですがなぜキリはもう休ませてもらえませんかあのねあの本当あのセブンでこうカスが一番を助ける役目でこう一瞬出てきてまあ龍河とく龍河ごとくエイトでまあカスがとキリのダブル主人公っていったものを発表してきたんですけれどもやっぱこう正しくキリがなぜここに至るまでになったのかっていうところはゲームでやっぱりちゃんと伝えなきゃいけないかなと思って。まあ、そこを楽しんでいただけるとよりこう龍が如くのこれまでの物語が深く理解できるようになるかなと思います。So,、uh, Kiryu appeared in Yakuza Like a Dragon in 7, kind of as a kind of he appeared as a side character very briefly and kind of helped out in the story. And in the next game, in Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, he's kind of a co protagonist with、uh, Kasuga Ichiban, right? So, we figured we kind of had to say, like, what happened? How did he get here? Like,、yeah. if we didn't do that, we felt like we'd be not really. His adopted daughter, now that he's come out of hiding, are we going to see? あったりはしますかねそこがあの今回の「セブンガイデン」の結構鍵となる設定で、まあ、そこはちょっと詳しくはお伝えできないんですけれども鍵となる設定で、まあ、そこはちょっと詳しくはお伝えできないんですけれども、まあ、非常にこう感情を大きく揺,すば、ね、こう揺さぶられるような物語になっているのでぜひ期待してください。So, we can't talk in too much detail about this because unfortunately it's very、uh, key to the plot of the story. But what we can say is that it's going to be an emotional and、uh, interesting tale, and we think you all like it. Oh, I'm certain we will.、Um, I also want to know if there are any familiar faces that we can expect to see. I am mostly just digging to see if we get to see Ichiban come back or my beloved Majima. Gotcha. Eto, Najimi no Kao toka, Ao koto wa a r u n d e s h o k a No, Tashi no Daiski na Kasuga Ichiban ya no Majima mo kuru n d e s k a ne? あのメインストーリー自体が本当にこうセブンの裏側とかも語られているのでやっぱりこう春日一番とかも、まあ、こう劇中にはやっぱりこう関与するというか登場しますし今までのレジェンドのキャラクターもいろいろサイドコンテンツとしても楽しめる部分もあるので、まあ、シリーズファンの方はすごく満足いけるような満足できるようなこう内容になっていると思います。So,、um, this kind of the plot of this game takes place in the kind of the shadows of Yakuza Like a Dragon. So, Kasuga Ichiban is very much related to the story. You kind of see hints of him throughout it.、Um, but outside of that, there's going to be also lots of 
legendary characters who you're familiar with with the series. You're going to see people pop up in side stories and other things. So he thinks that anybody who's a fan of the series is going to be fully satiated yes. by all the stuff that's going to pop up. <laughs> ah, amazing. <laughs> um, and obviously combat is a phenomenally huge part of the game as well. Um, so how does this game approach combat uh, and what kind of high-tech gadgets can we expect to use? えっと、このえっと、シリーズの中にはやっぱり戦闘があのメインのアクションになっているとは思うんですが、このゲームにおいてのえっと戦闘システムを教えていただけますか。また、ガジットはどんなものが入っているんでしょうか。はい、あの私
all our fans to feel welcome. However they choose to love someone, however they identify. You know, we've got um, one of the things, we were the first booth ever to be fully accessible. And so I've got a number of uh, fans here that actually are gamers that are in wheelchairs and they maybe play with the adaptive controller. This booth is fully accessible to them. We want everyone to feel welcome and feel the same love that we do for games. That's the common bond we have. And that's something that we prioritize. And I'm really proud of the team and the work they've done there. But Aaron, how has Gamescom been treating you so far? It's been great. I mean, we got to open opening night live with Starfield and the live action. We had surprise people that Todd Howard was here. We surprised people, Phil Spencer's here. We've got a theater for 300 fans to see the first opening of the game. Uh, so that's really special. We've got a theater for Forza Motorsport. We've got hands-on for Towerborn. We've got Stalker 2. We've got Party Animals. We've just got a lot of great games. It's the biggest booth we've ever had. It's a really big year for us. And so it's great to be able to celebrate that with more fans from all over the world than anywhere else right now. Can you tell us what, what about this community gets you excited? I think that I get inspired by stories about people, you know? Um, if I could actually maybe pull my friend Erwin. So this is Forza Erwin. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so, gosh, we know we're we've known each other for how many years? But he, he came to FanFest in 2015. Your wife was pregnant. Yes, exactly. Yes. He was sending me the ultrasound photos. He had to run back. He came here for FanFest. He had to run back. Um, he sent me the ultrasound photos. Yes. Uh, now your son is how old? Seven, seven years old. Seven and years old. I, I came to FanFest and I left at one o'clock or something like in the night and I live in the Netherlands. So it's like three and a half, four hours drive and then in the morning I had the first echo sound. And that's why we have a special bond also together because Aaron invited me to come to FanFest. And uh, since then it's been remarkable, amazing. Guys like Aaron and the rest of the team are so approachable and so much passion you know, in the team as well. And that shows you know, to the fans as well. We all share the same passion, it doesn't matter how you look like or where you're from or what language you speak, everybody is here the same and really uh, inclusive and that's what I really like. Yeah. yeah, and the neat thing about it is because we're in Germany, we have people coming from largely all over here. We have people from the UK, we have people from the Nordics, you know, from the Netherlands here with Erwin. And so that's the great thing. We've got a lot of Spanish fans we even have, you know, so that's that's really, really special. And one of the things that Erwin did I thought was really neat was he actually started, you started the Xbox Benelux yes. social handle. Yes, that, uh, that was the unofficial, official fan account of the Xbox. Uh, because there wasn't any in the Netherlands, right? And I'm so passionate about Xbox for many years. And yeah, we did collaborate on giveaways just to do something back for the community also. And I felt the responsibility to do that in the Netherlands, right? So I started off the Benelux, and since now a year, I gave the account to the Benelux team, and they picked it up really nice. So there's also investment being shown in that part, so. So he created our first social account for Xbox Benelux, and now he's handed it off to the Xbox team to run it because we're growing and investing and you know, committing more resources because how important the fans in the community here. It's such a wonderful story. Now, you're wearing Forza. Your name's Forza Irwin. You're one of the biggest Forza fans in the world. I think you were one of the first people to get to go see Forza Motorsport demo. What were your reactions? I mean, from a from a big fan, what what, yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a lifelong fan since Forza Run already. I collect all kind of stuff, um, and seeing it live this morning was super fabulous. I see that the improvement on the physics is really there. You see the weight trends are on the track. The graphics looks amazing in 4K 60. This was being shown on the Xbox Series X. So I'm super impressive. I can't wait till uh, 5 October. Uh, because then the pre-orders, let's say, go live when you have the premium edition. So I recommend everyone to get the premium edition as well. So if you're a fan, racing fan and sim racing, please go check it out. It's amazing. I cannot be enthusiastic enough about it. I was about to say, talk about enthusiastic fans. That's so amazing. Thank you so much, Irvin. <laughs> Thank you, Irwin. It's, uh, this is just one of many, many stories. We're so lucky to have great fans, the best fans in the world. We're that is That is what gives so much purpose to the work we do and why we love what we do. The joy and the power of gaming can have on the world is like nothing else. That sounds amazing. So what are your plans for tonight? Tonight I'm gonna go meet 300, no 400 of my closest friends and it's we're gonna take photos, we're gonna share memories. It's, you know, this is, this is like a family reunion. And, uh, but it's our Xbox family, and it's really, really nice to be here. That sounds very, very amazing. Aaron, thank you so, so much. And also, Irvin, thank you so much for being here. Guys, if you'd like to join the party, so check out the FanFest URL down below and register yourself to be part of FanFest, obviously, and to get, become a part of the community. So check out the link, sign up, and be here next year. If not, you miss out.
right? That's right. Cheers. It's the fast-paced action moment that we needed in our day here at Gamescom. And we can jump now into the armored world of Rubicon with Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon. From Bandai Namco Europe, please welcome Bertrand Manjon. Hi, Bertrand. Hello, hi. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here as well. I'm so excited to play some Armored Core 6 with you as well. So. Right off the bat, can you tell us where we are and what we can do here? So we are in uh, Armor Core 6, obviously, and uh, <laughs> we're currently in a mission which is uh, called Infiltrate Grid 086. So that's the first mission of the Chapter 2. Okay. So uh, generally when players reach this uh, mission, they should be able to play and know a be uh, have a better understanding of the uh, game mechanics. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll just progress through the mission and uh, and see how we uh, how we tackle the situation. Sure, let's take a look at them. So there, currently enemies are just attacking me. So I will uh, I will reply back. That's Deal the whole them. point in uh, <laughs> in Harmor Core. So you have to uh, to be quick. That's intense action all over the place. Mm. And react to what's coming at you straight away. Very cool. There's some um, destruction in the environment going on too. That's great to see. It and is, you're actually. using uh, your missiles there too? So yeah, that's the uh, basic uh, loadout for my AC, for my armor core. Okay. Uh, I have uh, rockets, uh, machine gun, and then uh, I also have a shield to protect from the uh, enemy's hits. Nice. And also a plas plasma blade, so oh. for more a melee, melee attack when yeah. I want to dive into the action yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> I like the plasma blade, that looks like a lot of fun. You're really fast. Yes, so that's the assault, assault boost. Mm. Uh, assault boost is something that uh, that you can use to uh, to reduce the gap between the enemies to be some kind of uh, more aggressive way to uh, to to go at the enemy. But it, it's uh, also used to be uh, some, you know, as a, an evasive action if you want to uh, to to evade some uh, difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Now, Bertrand, I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you today because I hear you've got quite a lot of experience in some other titles that you and the team were able to bring to Armor Core 6. Can you share with chat at home some of those as well? Uh, yeah, of course. So yeah, basically this is a From Software game. So you know, we know, we all know the expertise they, they, uh, they have shown uh, during the past decade. And uh, Armor Core is a compilation of what they know and what they have exploited and explored uh, with all their games. So you can have elements from Dark Souls, you can have elements from Bloodborne and Sekiro. So mm -hmm. players will, uh, I think, will be happy to see, to see that uh, uh, these kind of elements are now back in, uh, in Armor Core, even though the construction of the game is different mm. because it's a mission-based game. So, but yeah. yeah. And, uh, so I'm just, yeah. Facing a, a tough enemy right now, so okay. maybe I won't be speaking for uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> That's fine. I'll chat to chat as well. It's so nice to see um, some of you in Twitch chat as well. I'm, uh, as Bertrand mentioned, some of the Souls games that the team worked on. I'm a massive From Software fan. Um, maybe you guys in chat are as well. But I love Dark Souls One. I'm playing through Dark Souls Two at the moment as well. Um, but Elden Ring most recently was so much fun as well. So. Hello, oh, everyone okay in chat. So as you, you did see, it. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but every enemy, every uh, boss is in the game as a, an ACS goes, gauge. Yeah. Uh, so this gauge is uh, something that is really important. It's a key feature in the game because you have to raise and fill this gauge so that the enemy is staggered. So I'm trying to do it with uh, this AC right now. Mm -hmm. And once uh, an enemy is, is staggered, so once you have filled the gauge in red, yep. uh, you will notice that uh, it won't be moving for a short while. So you have to uh, to get advantage uh, within this time frame to to deal massive uh, damage to the uh, to the enemies. Nice. So that's that gauge at the top we can see yeah. above the enemy's name. That's so cool. But on the contrary, uh, you also have an SES gauge yourself. So that means that you can be staggered as well and uh -huh. take massive amount of damage. Yeah. So it's almost um, it's almost quite similar to Sekiro as well. The yeah, it's a reminiscence of the posture system in okay. Sekiro. So, 
Yeah, it's not exactly mm -hmm. the same system, but mm -hmm. it's uh, it's uh, something that is uh, the legacy of it. Yeah. And as I said, that's something that uh, that uh, from software has explored in other mm -hmm. games, and you can find it in uh, in Armor Core. Nice. From soft knows how to make some good games, so yes. <laughs> learn from the best. This is very intense combat we're seeing right now. It is now. actually. Yeah. So we're kind of like on this one level at the moment you're still using those boosters to dodge like you mentioned earlier and we kind of climbed up oh well done okay I nailed it i did it <laughs> well done <laughs> and breathe good <laughs> um yeah i wanted to mention that we climbed up to this platform almost through our boosters but you were using that to jump about as well yeah um yes. let's talk about the verticality in armor course yes as well. yeah so that's one of the main elements in the armor core so yeah you was we, we were talking about the previous front software games mm -hmm. uh, like uh, elden ring or dark souls and uh, and blood Bowl or Sekiro. so uh, Generally, players are used to, you know, stay on the ground for this yeah. game. And uh, in Armor Core, you have to, you have to, uh, to get vertical, I would say. So get up in the air, swipe, and boost forward, uh, backward, and so the three D, three D, three dimension is uh, something that you you have to take into account when you are facing enemies. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to try it out because, yeah, like you say, I'm very much used to having my feet stuck on the ground when I'm trying to platform sections of Souls games, so this looks like a lot of fun flying about too. Um, as we move to this level here as well, are we going to see some different environments? This one looks quite like wiry and technological so it, yeah, and stuff. So. That's right, yeah. The, the, this, this is depending on the mission, so okay. you have missions that are based in uh, this uh, kind of post-industrial I'm almost, almost dying, sorry, but the <laughs> <laughs> so post-industrial uh, environments, but uh, even within a mission, you can have some different environments. So uh, later on the mission, we will see some more narrowed or restricted environments. Okay. And even missions can take place in a more natural uh, background, such as a desert, mm -hmm. desert, sorry, desert, not that much. <laughs> and, uh, that would be a good level yeah. as well. <laughs> or snowy uh, environments, or okay. rocky environments. So I'm trying to open a door, but some, that, there's an enemy, enemy coming behind, so that's mm -hmm. usual from software trickery, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, we can call out quite a few times around some tight corners, you say. Yeah. Enemies lurking in the shadows. <laughs> I'm excited to explore some of the world of Rubicon then, and like you say, check out those different biomes and environments throughout Armour Core as well. And um, the level that we're playing through right now, um, we mentioned that this is kind of like a contract that you're running over Rubicon. Yes. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about, I guess, what our key objective is? So on there Power? are many factions that are uh, fighting for the core substance uh, okay. on Rubicon 3. And uh, we are playing the role of a mercenary, which is taking contract from different factions. Mm. So in this mission, we are uh, like uh, being tested by a, a faction called the Dozers, which are some okay. kind of uh, junkies, uh, mm -hmm. junkie addicted to the coral substance. Mm -hmm. But on other missions, we have uh, different uh, um, commands or commanders. So I'm more in a narrowed or restricted environment oh, yeah. now. So that's, you know, you can feel the tension and uh, you, you, you can, can you can bet that uh, there are some tricks and uh, and yeah so there's here is the best uh, location to use ah. the uh, scanning system so yeah. to see what kind of enemies are waiting for me <laughs> at the yeah. corner so there's it there's one here I will try to take him back. from a far, from, yeah from a range distance nice. and there's an oh. another one here <laughs> okay. Very good, Bertrand. <laughs> I see a lot of people in chat saying that the game looks amazing. Site officials said it there. Lots of you as well. That's so cool. It does. It looks so stunning as well. Just even That's these in, corridors. That's intense section all the way from A to Z. So mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. That plasma cutter looks so much fun. 
I guess as well you'll need to change up your different weapons depending on the environment you're in as well. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many weapons that you can allocate to the uh, to your AC mm -hmm. uh, depending on your playstyle and depending on the situation that you are facing as well. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it's 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 up to you to observe, try to different strategy if you are. You, you are facing a difficulty, a pick of this difficulty mm -hmm. that can happen. We are in front of a game, so yeah. <laughs> lots of tries and lots of ways to get it done. No, I'm excited to explore more of the weapons that we can collect or. Uh, ah, I can, I'm sure I, I will. I will show you the garage uh, feature. So this is where you can uh, change the load out of your uh, AC. Okay. Uh, to something different, something mm -hmm. that uh, is more efficient, uh, for instance, against an enemy or uh, against the boss. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. So we are reaching the uh, the final uh, areas of the mission oh, right yeah. now. So let's see what's uh, <laughs> what's what's, what's next. Us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This looks like it's building to some form of a. Uh, conclusion if I know my games. <laughs> oh! Yes, there are some platforms that can uh, allow you to reach higher levels, mm -hmm. so that's fine, that's cool. Okay, so what's there? Oh, there's a bunch of enemies there, so I can try to uh, to launch my rocket and see if uh, I can uh, have the multi-aim. Oh, I can't, I don't have any more uh, rockets. Oh no! Yeah, so uh, I will have to uh, do the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, what? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, uh, one more trick from, from oh, software, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Environmental damage. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so, yeah, bomb falling from the ceiling. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> why not? So, this enemy is a tough enemy because he's hiding behind a giant uh, shield, as yeah. you can see. So, and I'm, I, I mean, I'm wrecked. Oh no, real <laughs> time. <laughs> Oh, I'm lucky. Mission failed. Yeah. You died. But I can quickly show the uh, the garage. Let's do that. Yeah. Love the to assembly see it. system. So customization for your armor is no, going to so be this, a big. So this is where point. it takes place. So okay. that's one of the main main screen of the uh, where the players will uh, will have to uh, to explore some new tracks and strategies to mm -hmm. uh, to tackle the situation. So you have three main categories here. So the first one, the unit will affect the attack power of your AC. The frame parts will attack will affect the strength of your AC. Okay. The inner part will uh, will be uh, affecting the mobility, the mo mobility and uh, agility of your AC. And there you have the uh, expansion slot. So this is where you will uh, allocate some uh, 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 some active or passive skills. Okay. Yeah. So I will change some uh, some of the, of my weapons there because uh, I will probably go for um, the machine gun on this one. Sweet. So there are a bunch of weapons that can be like, allocated so to, your, to, to, to each of these slots. Yeah. And uh, so these weapons and the uh, AC parts uh, will be unlocked and uh, uh, through the story mm -hmm. because you will be earning credits that will be uh, allowing uh, you to uh, to purchase. Uh, the the parts and the weapons. So I'll go for the machine machine gun. I won't I won't be using the uh, the pulse blade. Uh, I think I'll go for the plasma rifle. Plasma rifle looks right. good. Yeah. I like the look of that. <laughs> nice. And we can see like a, a little hint or um, a demonstration of what it does. Exactly. Before we choose it. Yeah. Nice. So I, I will keep the missile uh, launcher. Mm -hmm. But I won't, I won't, I will get rid of the of the shield because I'm not a shield uh, player, even in the Souls game. So yeah. Me neither. Oh. <laughs> so let's we have let's go common. for another <laughs> another set of uh, missiles. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so bad with the shield. I much not prefer that. to have magic one hand and then a sword. I always forget about my shield. Oh, these these missiles that should looks do good. the should do the the job. That looks heavy. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> So let's go restart from checkpoint and uh, tackle the same situation again. Okay. Yeah. Nice. 
Can you change the color of the armor as well? Yes, that's also uh, okay. another feature in the garage. So you can uh, you can practically change everything from uh, the uh, you know the weapon color, the aspect of it. So if you want to uh, to have a rusty AC, it's yeah. possible, nice. and it's also possible to uh, to uh, to change the level of the rustiness so that you want to uh, your uh, your AC to be. Sick, stylize it. Yeah. Now, Bertrand, while you're just getting up to that uh, enemy as well, fans might notice if you're watching at home that we have something really cool sitting on this table. Mm, yeah, we true. have the Premium Collector's Edition, which I hear has uh, quite a lot of cool features that I'll read out real quick while you're dispatching these enemies and dodging those bombs from the ceiling again. Yes. Nice, there you go. <laughs> So the Armor Core Collector's Edition includes the game as well as a figurine of the Armor Core, which we can see looks sick right here sitting on the table. It's got your steelbook, pin badges, an exclusive garage as well, um, a digital soundtrack, hardcover art book, stickers and posters, which all looks so sick. How are you doing, Bertrand? I'm doing... Do you feel and you I'm, feel more confident with that? Yes, the loadout is much more efficient now. Oh my gosh! Yes. Very efficient! <laughs> Smashed it! I was expecting that to take a little bit longer, but... That was sick! Well so, done! Yeah, the door, the, this giant door should open now. Oh yeah? Yeah. They've surrendered, you dispatched all of their... Their gang. Well done. So as you can see, there's a marker on the left, mm -hmm. and that's the possibility to uh, to call for a, a supply sherpa, which will uh, uh, allow you to regain all your ammunition. So whenever you have this supply sherpa in the game, that means that uh, right after is something that uh, could be a, possibly mm -hmm. a boss fight. All of these environments look so sick. Yeah. All oh right, so dear. this is the bus time. Okay, so we've got the smart cleaner. The smart cleaner, yeah. I mean, I thought the enemy we just fought was a boss, but... Uh, so you can notice hefty. that I can uh, I can uh, focus on two weak points, one on the okay. at the bottom of it and one on the, on the top of it. So this is where I should focus uh, and shoot. I try to raise the... The stagger gauge, the SES. Uh -huh. And try to also keep a distance because with these giant swaps from these arms, it can deal a massive amount of damage. Nice. Yeah, I always love that in FromSoft games, like especially with bosses, it, it reminds me of this one, where you have different elements that you can target and that will maybe change woo, the way they react to you or how the fight is as well. It's always fun to find those weak points. So I'm, I'm evading with the assault boost, mm -hmm. just to keep a distance. And can you change the boost? Is that something that um, can we change the mobility of your armor core as well? So the yeah, if you, if, you, if, you, if you select some more booster with uh, more power, you can, uh, you can boost more quicker. Nice. Gamer Panda says this looks so cool and so smooth as well. Well, boss fights are the, uh, you know, the, the DNA of, uh, from software, so mm -hmm. in this game it's, uh, it's obviously the case as well, so... Yeah. That's sick. Char loving it, Bertrand, as well. Elle says, when I play this, it feels like I'm 15 years old again. <laughs> awesome playground. That's so sweet. Thank you. Glad you guys in chat are enjoying it. You're doing well, Bertrand. You've got over... Oh! I'm trying so to get the stagger on this boss. Yeah, so. you got this. Here it is. Nice. So now I can uh, throw anything, oh, everything I have to, yeah. to, uh, to lower the, the AP gauge, which is the elf gauge. Oh, he's over. He's rinsed. That was great damage. Smashed it. Ow. Oh, he's got <laughs> to find the two. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. You okay? I'm trying. <laughs> oh, well done. So you can uh, repair throughout the fight as well, I noticed. That's cool. Oh, no! 
I'm stuck. There's no suspect no. in my lips. <laughs> You're okay, I believe. Yeah, I'm okay with 61 points <laughs> remaining. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh, try. I'm sure you've done our life. Let's go. Uh, I won't. Uh, I will keep the distance from now on because. That sounds like a good tactic. Oh no! Oh, no. you wrecked me. Bertrand. Yeah, that's armor core. <laughs> that's armor core, me. I cannot wait to get stuck in as well. I'm so excited. So Twitch chat, we've got one more really cool giveaway for you. We have a chance to win something else that's super epic, as well as this fantastic statue, a custom Xbox Series X. Armor Core 6 console and controller. We're giving away a custom console and controller on Twitch right now. If you type exclamation mark Rubicon in Twitch chat to enter the giveaway. That's exclamation mark Rubicon, all lower case. Bertrand, that was so much fun. I'm really, really excited to play it. As a Souls fan who's not played the Armor Core series, that looks like a bit of me as well. So when can we play it? Ah, tomorrow. Tomorrow is launch hey. day. Yeah, so tomorrow you can uh, you can play. Yeah. Let's do it. I can't wait. Well, Bertrand, thank you so much for joining us. That thank was you for the fun. invitation. That of was cool. Course. Really cool. Thank you. Coming up, we've got the team from Elder Scrolls Online giving us a glimpse into how they bring the realm of Apocrypha to life with the community in mind. Then we'll dive into new gameplay from Ara History Untold. But first, it's the latest from a Dragon Quest spin-off known by manga fans everywhere. This is Infinity Strash Dragon Quest The Adventures of Dai. The legendary Dragon Quest manga and anime is coming to Xbox Series S and X and Windows as a new exhilarating action RPG in Infinity Strash. Dragon Quest, the adventure of Dai. Take charge of Dai and the disciples of Avar, Pop, Nam, and Hyunko in their battle against the Dark Lord Hadla and his monstrous army. Adler's ghastly army will take all your cunning and skill to overcome. The Dark Army consists of six legions full of gruesome beasts led by their powerful commanders that will not be easily defeated. React in the moment with real-time combat where you can switch between characters as the battle intensifies. Each character has their own set of unique skills to help collectively defeat your enemies. Knives and swords, devastating magic, the power to heal, and dark aura skills. Everything you need to crush your adversary. The game delivers the full Sovereign Rock Castle arc narrative from the anime. What? Covering up to episode 41, where you'll experience all the excitement of the story recreated with dynamic and explosive playable battles. Collect and equip accessories known as Bond Memories to boost your chances of defeating the Dark Army. These are awesome, because not only do they level up the stats of the character they are equipped to, they also unlock scenes from the original manga. If you are having a hard time progressing through the story, or just want to become even stronger, you can take on the Temple of Recollection. Here, you can earn rewards to level up the spells and skills of your party members, as well as strengthen bond memories. The temple is a repeatable dungeon that changes every time you play through it. The further you progress, the harder it gets. You'll have to decide whether to exit the temple with your earnings and your life, or risk it all for the promise of something even greater. You will need all the power and strength to delve deeper into the tougher end of the story. So use your earnings from the Temple of Recollection to level up and customize your team. Once you've completed the story, Challenge Mode is unlocked. Here, you will find unique, supercharged quests that offer even greater challenges not seen in the main game. You can collect all of Dai's memories in the game's scrapbook, unlocking different pieces while playing through the story. And to complete the book, you will also need to clear the full Temple of Recollection. 
Whether you love action RPGs, Dragon Quest, anime, or all of you, the adventure starts here in your quest to become a true hero in Infinity Strash. Dragon Quest, the adventure of Dai. More than 22 million players across the globe, our next game can truly be called a phenomenon. Joining me to give a glimpse into the Elder Scrolls Online Gamescom experience, please welcome Matt Fyrell. How are you doing, my dear? Thank you, I'm doing great. Yeah, good. It's been a busy couple of days for you, but we're going to have a fantastic chat about what is quite honestly one Excellent. of my favorite games ever. So uh, folks who have played the newest ESO expansion, Necron, will no doubt recognize from all the footage we've shown of Gamescom so far in the booth, our wonderful Daedric Prince over there looming over everybody. And I'd love for you to tell everyone at home exactly what fans have been up to on the booth, aside from snuggling up with Hermaeus Mora. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, Hermaeus Mora is uh, ah. the Daedric Prince of uh, of knowledge, and he's super creepy. Uh -huh. uh, and it's awesome. And, yeah. uh, people, That's what makes him awesome. That was what makes him awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah, among many things. But uh, yeah, and, and actually, if you take your selfie, uh, if you take a selfie with him and post it on uh -huh. social media, you get a free copy of the game here. It's not a bad a thing to do, is it? Yep. Yeah. And you've got a massive area over there. Me yep. and Phil were talking. We want to go in and steal a table, but there is more than just a cool table in the booth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had a little community meet and greet earlier, yep. and there's literally a round table there. So mm -hmm. we had a round table with the fans. It was great. I love and, it. And uh, you can, of course, get hands on with the game. Uh -huh. And uh, and then there's, of course, the giant statue of Hermes Mora. So right at it's the a end. great time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great opportunity as well for folks who, for some reason or other, haven't played it yet to just come in and check it out. And you really get the whole vibe of yep. the game in there so brilliant setup absolutely love it but back to the game itself it's now been two months bizarrely somehow since Necrom came out and I'd love to hear from yourself what the reaction has been like so far it's been fantastic mm -hmm. um, good, good this is the it's the highest rated chapter ESO has had and mm -hmm. we've had I think six or seven now so yeah. uh, right uh, it has a um, been received super well by the fans. Yeah. Uh, we added a new class called mm -hmm. the Arcanist, yep. which uh, players just absolutely adore. We called it the Book Wizard in our streams. <laughs> it is, in fact, a Book Wizard. Yeah, exactly. Based, based on knowledge, he has really <laughs> cool graphical effects, and uh -huh. uh, it's just a, a whole lot of fun to play. Yeah. So, and of course, it's back in Morrowind. It's a part of Morrowind that players haven't been to before in an Elder mm -hmm. Scrolls game. Yep. And then you get to go to Hermaeus Moore's Plane of Apocrypha, yeah. which is basically a giant dungeon built out of books. Yeah, So it's absolutely. great. Like, And the story, you know, Elder Scrolls in any Elder Scrolls game from Arena to Skyrim to Elder Scrolls Online. You know all what you're doing, stories. don't you, when it comes to story? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And no spoilers, <laughs> but the story in this one is amazing. Yeah, please go finish it. My favorite yeah. thing about when it opened up, um, an insight into my gameplay style is I'm very much the completionist. Yep. So whenever I get a new part of the map, I get to go in and tick off all the little bits. And so yeah, absolutely yep. adore it. Yep. One of my favorite new places to stay in. Um, but to, onto the community itself and being here at Gamescom um, and all the online community of, at home as well, hugely passionate around the globe. Um, cheeky question, how is it even remotely possible to keep your finger on the pulse of so many people playing this game? I mean, they're 
many answers to that, yeah. but one of them is that's why we come to shows like Gamescom, mm -hmm. right? It's like, as an American developer, right, Europe is hugely important to Elder Scrolls yeah. Online, and Germany is the second largest community, mm -hmm. the German-speaking community here, is the second largest community in the game. So we take our definitely time out of our schedules to go to community events in the United States and also to come here. Touch base, thank them. Thank them. I've just met with fans right before I came on stage here, and it's, uh, it's like us as developers, you know, that sit in our dark offices, you know, for most of the year. <laughs> Plotting away. You know, to come here and just see people and talk to them about what the game means to them is the reason why we do this, right? Because ESO would not exist without the players. We were speaking about this before. Yeah, there's yep. Games don't make it to 10 years with right. the numbers that you've got without yep. an incredibly passionate and excitable it, fan base. And, and it's true. And games of this type, like the communities that are welcoming mm -hmm. are the games that last for a long time. And we have a fantastic community. New players are always welcome. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like home. And it leads me on superbly to my next point, which I was going to say myself. There's something about the ESO community that is, the word you use, so welcoming. Yeah. And I hear that you have some favorite stories of the fans or ah. that the fans have shared with you that you want to share. And I am all ears. Indeed I do. So uh, a couple, actually last month, we had the ESO Tavern here in Germany. And we okay. do that as a community event we have every year. For anyone in chat who might not know what that is, can you break it down a little bit for me? What is the Tavern? So the Tavern yeah. is where European community can come to Germany once a year and go and meet uh, ESO developers, meet each other. Um, you know, there's all usually music and of course food and drink and yeah. fun and a little cosplaying. And, I mean, you say that just yeah, as people I walk on. Oh my goodness <laughs> me, that looks like a, was that sleeping bags? Yeah, uh, no, I think more cushions. Oh, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, usually it's, it's a whole day and it's a whole day stuff and it's really just people can meet other people mm -hmm. that where ESO means so much to everyone. Yeah. So, and in fact, in that in that tavern this year, um, we had a special promotion where if you told your story about your favorite ESO story, mm -hmm. uh, we picked three winners of, of that uh, to get a pass to the tavern. Mm -hmm. And I have the stories with me. Oh, right now. There are some stories I wrote on, down earlier. On parchment. Go on, let's hear a couple of them. I can't wait. All right, and and to be to be clear, these are stories that our own fans wrote. These are the ones that got them in the door. Yes, that yeah. got them in the door. But yeah. it's these are real words from users telling us what ESO means to them, right? And they're all a little different, but it shows the breadth of it. So uh, uh, the first one is from uh, Geraldine and Tobias, and uh, of course they probably wrote it in German. In order to preserve uh, international peace and tranquility, I'm going to read it in English. Uh, so, um, uh, so Geraldine and Tobias, ESO is something very special for both me and my partner as it was our first game together at the start of our relationship and we are still playing today. We've been together for over five years and we love experiencing new things together in ESO. It's helped our relationship grow for which we're grateful. That's really yep. lovely. We have so many, so many people have met in the game yes, yeah. and have gotten married and I mean and it's amazing and we see them at the at the at the fan events. So very good. Incredible. Uh, so here's Silas and Jonathan. Uh, I've been playing ESO since the beta, I've, uh, which was in 2013, just Goodness. to put it in perspective. Wow. Uh, I've been playing ESO since the beta. I vividly remember the launch. It seemed like yesterday and it was so much fun starting a new adventure. Now, nine years later, I know Tamriel like the back of my hand. <laughs> I've saved Nern many times. I've done and seen it all, and I still can't get enough. I introduced my son to the game in 2017, and he's as big a fan as I am. Aww. Now we go on adventures together. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. <laughs> we heard a lot of feedback during the pandemic where sometimes families, if kids were at college or elsewhere, mm -hmm. they could actually meet that in game and point. game together. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a virtual world like that. 100% it is, isn't it? And uh, uh, the player named Jarzul uh, wrote, I returned to online RPGs, which I had previously played from 1999 until about 2015, sometime shortly after the start of the pandemic in mm -hmm. 2020. I was fascinated by ESO, of course, due to the fact it's an Elder Scrolls universe, but also the regular updates and endless content that this game offers. What also caught my eye over time through visiting many streams on Twitch and regularly following social media is the incredible one-of-a-kind relationship between the community and you, the developers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> seriously, thank you. Uh, this relationship is special and welcomes new players from the very start. 
And I think that those two sentences pretty much sums up what we feel about the community as well. Oh, I absolutely love it. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to test a story on you now, if that's all right. My own experience, I want to see if this will get me in the door of the tavern, right? <laughs> uh, on the Xbox On streams, uh, we play ESO. Uh, got to a point like weekly, we were taking over the schedule to play it, and we were having community nights in the evening where we would pick a region on the map, we'd post a picture in Discord, and what <laughs> we'd do is there would be about somewhere between 16 to 20 of us would all come online and we'd go and we would just smash all of the bosses out and we clear everything because yep. it's be quite difficult for some people solo and in doing that loads and loads of people downloaded the game for the first time to play it with us and we decided to join a guild and create a guild for everyone to be in and we called it the postcode lottery <laughs> and i would love to know if we would be allowed in the tavern one time <laughs> absolutely yeah let's yes. go so we're gonna anytime. go everybody yeah. <laughs> fantastic <laughs> so we mentioned the new people who play both both for us and in the stories you've shared there. And new memories are also being made every single day. So really, the question is, what is the secret behind making a 10-year-old game so enticing to new players? Uh, I could do a whole GDC talk on Let's that. Do <laughs> no, but um, obviously the game has evolved over time. Yes, and because course, yep. players' preferences evolve over time, as developers, we get better and can tell better stories. So the story of ESO is the story of evolution, right? Yep. It's, it's making the game better over time. An example of this is uh, right now we're doing um, a bunch of new features that just launched on PC and on console next week mm -hmm. to make new users more welcome in the game, not from the community, but from the game. Yeah. Because the game is so big now, we want to make sure that it's not overwhelming when yeah. new users come in. Course, so yeah. just an example of, you know, we're constantly changing, constantly evolving. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So Talk even though you are conflict, 10 years in, you're thinking you about that onboarding new player experience. Oh, yeah. And that looks like. We yeah. have had so many new players this year. So, uh, you know, ESO is still very, very, very successful. We're not done yet. And we're not done yet. In fact, next question, what is next for ESO? Well, Where we're at the... We're at the nine and a half year mark, you know, Goodness. for ESO's launch on PC, <laughs> right? Which means next year is a big year. Yep. Um, it's our 10th anniversary. We're probably going to do a bunch of interesting things, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about later in the year. But uh, also, um, we have another update coming the end of the year, mm -hmm. which has a feature which we've been very secretive about called... <laughs> called Can the we unlock the secret today or am I going to have to wait? Well, a little more of the secret, oh. but uh, it's called the Endless Archive. Okay. And uh, we're going to have a preview stream on September 14th. Right. Uh, yep, for the Endless Archive. It'll be on the Bethesda Twitch channel. Mm -hmm. So we'll, of course, announce this before so you don't yep. have to quickly write everything down right now. <laughs> but, uh, but we'll go into detail on that whole update, including what the Endless Archive actually is. Oh. And of course, besides that, ESO will always get new content added. Yep. We'll always do quality of life fixes. We're already working well into working on next year's chapter. So uh, it's the train keeps rolling. I mean, it's a great game, and as long as people, like the great communities here, keep playing it, it's going to keep going. I'm certain it will, and I'll be right there with them. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Um, do let me know if you ever need a warden in any of your daily dungeon runs, and I'll be there right there to help keep you. Keep it out. in mind. Yeah, thank you very much. Right, we'll be back with a first look at extended gameplay for the PC Grand Strategy title, Ara History Untold, coming to PC Game Pass day one in 2024. And speaking of Game Pass, we're giving away three months of PC Game Pass very, very soon. So keep an eye on Twitch chat. But first, let's fly into the future of Pigeon Simulator, Matt. Enjoy this. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. There. 
The world untouched. No thrones ascended. No history yet written. Just people waiting to be led somewhere extraordinary by you. However you choose to change the world, one thing is certain. History will never be the same. grand strategy game that puts you at the center of history. We've got your first extended look at Aura History Untold and here to introduce us to the game and play tour guide through the Aura experience here at Gamescom. Please welcome Livy and Matt. Guys, thank you so much for having me here. Of course. Yeah, on behalf of the entire team at Xbox Publishing and Oxide Games, we're so, so excited to have you here and we're so excited to be showing off gameplay at Gamescom. Yeah, it's a really incredible opportunity to be here in Köln and get the chance to show the world the game and the booth looks so much fun. But I would say I can't wait to play the game, to have a look into the game. So let's go inside, all right? Sounds let's great. Go. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. And just like that, we're here in the theater. And Matt, tell us about one of the ways that Aura differs from other grand strategy games fans may have played. Sure, happy to. I'm really excited to get a chance to share Aura with the world today and show our gameplay preview here from Gamescom. One of the things I love about this game is how 4X gamers, turn-based strategy gamers, historical gamers are going to find a ton that feels really familiar. It feels like coming home. You know, feels like this is it. I know exactly what's going on. This is kind of my vibe. But Aura History Untold also features a number of unique gameplay features, like the living world is my personal favorite. The way that the game presents a more organic, seamless, natural environment where you can sort of discover the things that you do and have an impact on the map as you play. So excited to see more, so let's jump in, I would say, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, let's dive in. So, for our History Untold, one of the very first decisions that you make is to choose one of the historical leaders to play in the game. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be who leads your nation from the beginning of your nation's uh, you know, civilization, from their society, all the way up to the modern era and a little bit beyond. For Gamescom, we're just going to be showing off nine leaders, but I'm going to go ahead and pick one of my favorites. Do you have a, a favorite historical leader from the game, Melly or Libby? Yeah, so I'm wearing this headdress of golden laurels um, in honor of Sappho, who is a leader in the game. Um, so Sappho, um, one of the great things about our history untold is that it features leaders not just of um, militaries, of global, of government, but also um, it features leaders of arts and culture and um, invites players to play and explore a world as them. Um, so Sappho, who was someone who was not necessarily a leader in government, but has um, left a significant impact on arts and culture. Um, I, she's a leader in Aura, and she's definitely one of my favorite leaders to play as. I am someone who also loves to play, uh, as Matt mentioned, tall instead of wide. I like playing with um, arts and culture and um, beauty aesthetics in mind, as opposed to, um, I'm not so much of a combat. I totally like understand, because that's probably the road, route I, I would take yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what about you? Who's your favorite historical leader? Well, so for today, for Gamescom, I'm gonna pick one of my favorites. I'm gonna pick Harun Al Rashid. Okay. So, and how does the leader choice affect, like, the gameplay and everything? Absolutely, yeah. So, the leaders in our History Untold have a ton of effect on gameplay. They have two major sets of traits. They have personality traits. The personality traits of each leader affect things from the gameplay, from the partnerships with other uh, nations. It's how AI plays them as well. And then they have a unique leader trait. Harun al-Rashid was famous for leading the Abbasid Caliphate in the 5th century. And one of the things about him is he led a golden age for his people. And so the traits in the game reflect his historical reality and the things that he accomplished with the creation of the House of Wisdom. 
And so you can see some of the powers that these provide, extra trade routes, increased immigration to the capital. Harun al-Rashid is your classic tall strategy leader where you play as a leader that builds up a small number of cities and builds them very, very big, very, very powerful, very large, as opposed to spreading out all over the map. And he's a little bit more focused on culture, sciences, arts, and winning that way, as opposed to bloodshed and warfare. Another one of the ways that our history untolds differentiates itself is we really wanted to lean into the idea that you rule how you want to rule. You lead how you want to lead, that you become the leader you want to become. And the way we do that is through a system we call prestige. Within our history untold, prestige is the way you actually win the game. It's your score. It's how you build points up over time. And there are dozens of ways to earn prestige in the game, but really they're reflective of how you want to play, how you want to lead your nation. So with Harun al-Rashid, I'm probably going to be leaning into some masterpieces, cultural works, great uh, triumphs, which are what we call the most amazing buildings from throughout history, and see if I can build up that way. So that sounds so exciting. Moving in here, the very first thing you'll probably notice is that living world, right? Our history untold is built up in a way where you can zoom all the way down to level, see your citizens living their lives. So this is an early settlement. It's 6,000 BCE. And I have my little people wandering around, uh, part of my, my nation here. They're living their daily lives. They're farming the land. I have a workshop over here, which is going to be important for the crafting system, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but you can see right away there's kind of a different shape to the world. It's more organic. It's not hexes. It's not tiles. Yeah. It's not a grid. We have natural borders, the places that you would expect to see those borders in real life, like along rivers and mountain ranges. And you can see other things like these you know, dangerous wildlife. And you can actually go and find these rhinoceroses terrorizing these, these cows. So I won't be able to harvest those cows or, or utilize them until I clear those rhinoceroses from the territory. The dangerous wildlife used to actually be mobile. It used to roam around the map and just attack you um, kind of without warning sometimes. And so uh, needless to say, players found that a little bit off-putting. So um, we would get full posts um, in, our, like, in our forums just going like, nope, don't like the dangerous wildlife. Uh, this is too much. And so um, the team at Oxide took that feedback, uh, scaled it way back, and then implemented it more like this. So it's something that you can strategically move towards and then um, hunt for resources, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, for instance, if you know that the hyenas are causing a problem for your civilization, um, you can be prepared, one, and then you can um, take steps to have a hyena-free society. <laughs> Which is a goal, I guess, in yeah. the savannah. <laughs> it would be a great goal to have in the savannah. So one of the first things you'll do in the game is you'll have your scout unit. Your scout is an early explorer unit that you use to discover things on the map, to expand your point of view and your perspective in the world, and also to uh, uncover you know, ancient relics from previous civilizations that came before you, previous nations and societies of people, and to be able to take those goods and bring them into your own national inventory. So I'm going to go ahead and take my scout. I'm going to move them there. Now, you may notice that my scout has moved to the edge of this region, but they haven't actually moved into this zone. And that's because Aura History Untold features true simultaneous turns. What true simultaneous turns are is all of your actions and choices, the decisions that you make in Aura, are queued up in a queue that goes into a turn processor at the end of the turn. So once you've ended your turn, that's when everything activates. All the decisions that you made in a turn go off at the same time, as well as all the decisions of every other nation in the game. And where there are conflicts, there are rules in the game and a depth to the rules that allows those conflicts to play out. So if you've ever played a board game called Diplomacy, it's a little bit like that. Okay. It's a little more lifelike, wouldn't you say? I would say, yeah. yeah. I would say it's a little bit more realistic, a little bit more authentic to how real things go. In real life, it isn't always, I take a turn, you take a turn, then you take a turn, then I take a turn. It's really more like we're all doing things all the time. And that's kind of what we wanted to simulate with the true simultaneous terms and what our amazing partners at Oxide Games have been aiming for. So the other big decision I'm going to make early on is, is what to build. So we call the buildings that you make in the game improvements. And these improvements are things from farms, the workshop, my village hall, which is the center of my, my territory. I'm going to go ahead and start with a mine. And the reason I'm starting with a mine is that I am gaining a lot of food. I'm gaining a lot of wood. I've got a good amount of coin coming in, but I don't have any stone. Mm -hmm. And Savannah is actually a really great place to build a mine because there is a lot of good rock, a lot of good natural earth. You can kind of take a look at the, um, at the yields when you're building up improvements and see what some of those things are. So you can see this is good for stone. One thing the savannah is not great at, though, is wood. So I'm going to take my scout. I'm going to keep exploring. My goal is to go and find some forests. The other thing you have to do on the first turn is pick a technology. Mm -hmm. Technologies in our history untold represent the kinds of scientific advancements that people have made throughout history. 
you have a tech deck for each era. We start in the ancient history era, and then you'll draw some of these texts as sort of like drawing cards from a deck and get to select from those. So my first three technologies that I've gotten to pick from are docks, which I probably won't pick because although I do there's have... no water yeah, nearby yeah, it. There's an ocean down here, but I'm, I'm not really there yet, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to build docks right away. Um, now, measurement scales is good because this is a, a technology, it's a commerce technology. It builds me ways to get more coin through a trading post. It also gives me access to a great triumph, the Great Pyramid of, of Giza, which gives you a ton of prestige if you were the first and the only nation in the world to build it. I could also take kilns, which is a, um, a, a technology for pottery, for building out an artisan studio, if I wanted to move down the culture route. Right now, though, I'm kind of interested in coin. I want to make a little cash, make a little Skrilla, get going. So I'm going to go ahead and build those measurement scales. It always helps, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and then after that, I'm going to go ahead and end my turn. And you can see all of the moves have accomplished. Day turns to night, night turns to day. It's now the year 5875 BCE. My people have explored further out their surroundings. They've discovered some of these incredible things. And I've also made a new friend or potential enemy. This is an independent settlement. Independent settlements in uh, are, are they're nations that are not really nations yet. They're these small city-states or small groups of people that have founded a tribe or founded a place somewhere in the world. They're not represented by other players. You can't play as an independent settlement in the game. They're controlled by the AI and they can become your friends. You can even convince them to join your nation by completing enough quests and helping them along. Um, or you can, you know, conquer them, pillage, take, take all the things. It's basically up to you. Again, rule. The choice is yours, right? Yeah, rule yeah. how you want to rule. So right now, my scout has discovered this great, uh, this great independent settlement. I'm going to wait till they come talk to me. Mm -hmm. They're going to probably want to bring me a quest or something soon in a couple turns. I could hunt these hyenas, which are causing me some problems over here. Can if they I really attack your scouts as well? Well, so that's what's fun about the dangerous wildlife. Instead of having kind of roving packs of wildlife that are, are a danger, instead it's sort of a, a give and take. You have to make a choice as to whether or not to hunt the wildlife or to leave it alone. But until you hunt it, it's blocking your ability to play in that region. I can't build a farm here sure. or a mine or a logging camp until I remove those hyenas. So it's kind of a give and take and it's sort of a risk. They also do have the ability to hurt your scout unit if uh, the hunt is more dangerous. So you can see the hyena is not a terribly dangerous hunt, just two of those little symbols, rhinos. Yeah. A lot That's more dangerous. a different story, yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so I'm going to keep going northwest, though. Instead of, of harvesting these equipment or hunting these uh, hyenas, I think what I want to do is I want to keep exploring because I really need some wood. Let's check in on the city. We're still building that mine. We're a few turns out, so we've got a little time. And let's end our turn. All right, we're two turns away from our mine, and our world has expanded. We've discovered more territory. And if you can see out in the distance here, you can just start to see the edge of what if I had to guess, was a tropical jungle. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be really handy for me as a, as a nation that hasn't discovered any wood yet, hasn't have a lot of great lumber logging potential being built on this you know, beautiful savanna-like territory. Um, so instead of continuing to push that way, let's, let's, let's do a hunt so we can check that out. So you can see my people have moved into position to hunt these hyenas. You can see the hyenas scatter as they run away from the hunters. And then we move back to our main city here, and we'll go ahead and end our turn. We're so close to growing to level two, uh, to building up our city even more. Our uh, hunt was successful. And then in addition to a hunt, we found some fur and some leather. And that's fantastic. We earned those things by completing the hunt successfully, by defeating those, those animals. And so those go into what's called our national inventory. The national inventory is one of the ways that R really differentiates itself from other games in this genre. It is a way to express a more complicated economic system with more depth and more strategy to it that allows you to make a bunch of decisions about how to utilize the natural resources around you, how to build other things out of them. The game has an in-depth crafting system that allows you to take all of those resources and equipment, put them together in a bunch of interesting ways to create military units, armies, special equipment, as well as a ton of improvements and some of the great triumphs that you need. All right, so I'm gonna keep exploring. Is there anything specific you'd like to see uh, me zoom in on over here in the world to just check out before we move on to the next turn? I just love screw zooming in as, so as close as possible and seeing um, like just all, all the, the people. Details. Yeah, yes. all the little civilians just living their lives. Yeah. It's, um, oh it's no, the animals <laughs> are running away from the curse. That's no, they sure are. Sure right. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you, right? Yeah. If there was a giant cursor flying around in real life, I'd, <laughs> oh, I'd get away from away. it too. <laughs> there are thousands of little touches like that in the game where the game feels interactive, where that living world is an interactive simulation that feels yeah. so fun and feels great to just play. The game's very 
very touch friendly. You just want to kind of mess around with stuff and see what they do, click on things, move around, in addition to you know, strategizing your conquering of the world. Oh, what's happening over there, Matt? Oh, this is exciting. So what we've discovered here is a hidden resource. Oh. Hidden resources in Aura are these places where you know, things might be a little bit below the surface. You know, for example, if you were to look for iron, you probably wouldn't see a big piece of iron sticking out in the land. You would have to survey, you'd have to go a little deeper. One of the things explorers can do is if there's hints of a hidden resource somewhere, they can uh, move to that hidden resource, they can actually survey and mm -hmm. explore and then it'll expose what that hidden resource is. And some of them can be very, very powerful, very useful. And then you can decide if you want to like mine that resource. Exactly. Okay, you cool. You can choose to build a city there, expand into that region, and uh, give yourself that opportunity to uh, take advantage of that hidden resource. So let's see what we get. Let's take a look here and let's survey this hidden resource and see what's uh, there to find. Now, unfortunately, this region has already been taken over by our friends from the Indian Empire under Ashoka in the city of Delhi, their capital. So whatever we find here is going to be a little bit hard for us to claim, but I'd still rather know what it is than not. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and definitely check that out and see. Will the other leader get a notification about you scouting his hidden resource? Luckily not. Okay. They'll, um, he, they'll know I'm in their territory, but yeah. right now we have open borders. I could uh, negotiate closed borders. They could kick me out of their borders. I could not let them through my borders. Right now, I'm still trying to be friendly. I propose trade routes with everyone. I really want to you know, make friends with my neighbors. And it looks like this very first what bit is... What do we is, have here? Oh, Dye. it's dye. Oh, nice. Dye is an interesting resource because you can use it to improve the lives of your citizens through a number of things you can build. You can build various types of clothing and things that are sort of luxury items that really help your, your nation feel you know, feel like they're doing uh, well, like they're happy, like they're fulfilled. And that, that happiness really comes into play when you're trying to expand, when you're trying to grow, when things are improving for your nation. Um, so, oh, looks like we have a quest from our friends in Kuzdar. So they have decided to ask me to start the agricultural revolution. So this is a group of people who are hunter-gatherers right now, and they want me to research basic agriculture and share that technology with them so that they can sort of advance their own society. This will help me sort of get them on my good side. It'll move them up a level of friendliness, and it will give us the opportunity to earn some tools, some pottery, and some prestige. So I'm definitely going to go for this. I want to do that. And frankly, I was probably going to learn basic agriculture anyway, right? Everybody needs to farm, and I've got some great stuff to farm here. So two flies with one swat. Exactly. <laughs> or, or as I like to say, feed two birds with one scone. <laughs> Oh, that's so, a lovely saying. <laughs> it's a little more friendly, right? It's yeah. kind of chill. I like it. Um, all right, so we're continuing to move north. I was right. That is a tropical yeah. forest. Looks like we've got some... Oh, a bear. Some bears over here. You can see them kind of looking for honey and probably other things. Maybe some of my citizens, hopefully not. And deep here in this jungle, we probably can't spot them. They're well camouflaged. There's uh, an alligator. So of course. Some more dangerous stuff. But if I want to build a logging camp later, that's going to be a great place to do it. Um, so another thing has happened. My scout's still idle. Let's go ahead and, and move down here, collect some of these ruins and get some more things. Maybe check out those horses as well. And it looks like our mine has been completed. Let's see my people harvesting stone from the nation, getting ready. And you can see that we're building up our stone now. We're going to be getting a lot more stone this turn. The city, though, is idle. They want us to build more. So let's go ahead and pick another thing to build. I'm going to build a camp. And the reason I want to build a camp is because a camp gives us coin. It gives us access to more money, more, and that's, again, great for Haroon al-Rashid, great for anybody. Um, but it's a great early improvement to build. So you can see the camp will come in there, and you can see the city sort of evolves to move around it. Roads are built and housing. And then we'll go ahead and enter. All right, here's my scout. They've discovered this new area. Let's go ahead and capture that ruins. All right, there's another cache of supplies out there to go find, which is cool. And then our city has reached a new population milestone. And that is very exciting. What that means is there is now another worker available. So within our history and told, cities have levels. And these levels are representative of how many people you have in the city, and it builds over time. So we started out as a small settlement, under 100 people. Now we're over 100 people. We're, we're a hamlet. To be or not to be a hamlet. Not that kind of hamlet. Um, but we're a small city, we're a small settlement, and, and we're starting to grow up now. And because of that, we have access to more workers. Workers represent sort of the national effort that you put forward behind things to try to improve your nation. And so I'm going to go ahead and assign my wor worker here. My first worker was assigned to the farm. And the reason for that was to gain rate more food, to help us gain ground and, and get healthier, and, and also uh, improve my growth. 
my second worker I'm going to put in the village hall. And the reason I want to do that is it's going to speed up how fast my nation can claim regions. Claiming regions is how you get new territory, is how you expand the borders of your cities. And so I really want to claim a region soon. So I'm going to put my worker in my village hall so they can start working on that because there's some great regions out here to grab some territory. But Livy, looking at the game, there's so much love for detail. Like So much. How yeah. many people are actually working on this game? Yeah, so the team at Oxide Games is um, about 60 people, give or take. But they do also just love um, putting in all these little details for players to find. Like That's really like one of the things that they're really good at, too. So um, as soon as you get your hands on Aura, whenever that is, keep um, keep exploring, keep finding little things. I think the game's going to keep surprising you for many, many years. Like how many Easter eggs have you planted? So many Easter eggs. <laughs> That's yeah. so amazing. Uh, so another thing now that I've got my ability to claim a region, my city's grown and, and I put the worker in the village hall, it's sped up. I've got a lot of options here. I've got some that I need to clear out. You can see the yields from each of the individual biomes. The game has many, many biomes from everything from Arctic tundra to Zarek shrubland to savannas. Uh, temperate rainforest. Um, but for right now, we're in the savanna here. We've got a few different resources. I think, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I think I want to grab down here. This is a great region for a few reasons. Offers some good food, and you can obviously see there's access to rice. So there's rice fields here you can cultivate. And you're closer to the water. Yep. And we're closer to the water, which is going to be important for trade, for coastal improvements as well. So let's go ahead and take that. That's going to be the place. We're going to take Ardabil, which is a, another region southwest of me, or southeast. And we'll see, we're still a little ways off from that camp. Let's go ahead and check in on our scout. Let's keep moving into that rainforest. I want to see a little bit more over there. And then we earned some new things in our inventory. We have some, ah, some bronze ingots, some brass ingots, and some tools. None of these are immediately usable by my nation. I can't immediately take advantage of them to like expand my society, to increase my happiness. There are tons and tons of resources in the game, over a hundred. Things like books that let you expand your education. Things like candles that give you the opportunity to spread religion faster and also expand education in these early eras where people didn't have access to light sources. And so if you can give your people candles, they all of a sudden have the ability to read at night. And that expands your education. So, these are going to be important for later, but right now I can't really use them yet. They're going to go into my inventory and I'll be able to use them to maybe build those pyramids or something else. And it looks like my research is completed. I've found measurement scales. I can draw some new technologies. Haroon's a little bit of a traditionalist, big into religion. I think I'm going to go for animism, start my, my path down religious discovery. It also unlocks a new government, theocracy, which will allow me to expand my nation further. All right, and from here, we'll continue to explore. I found a new independent settlement. You can see they're a little bit different. They've built out here in this, this tropical jungle. They have a kind of a different vibe, different people wandering about, different experiences because of their sort of different life. And then over here in the savannah, we've got our, our thing going on, which is going pretty well. We've claimed this region now, which means we can build improvements on it. And we were the first uh, to discover that independent settlement, which gained us a little bit of prestige. What was your main inspiration for this game? Our friends and partners at Oxide have between them decades, if not centuries of experience working on some of the biggest turn-based strategy games of all time, and including some of my own personal favorites. And so they wanted to take all of their learnings from years and years of building these kinds of games and build something that, again, feels familiar, but at the same time evolution, uh, sort of evolves the genre, modernizes it, brings it forward in a bunch of new ways with things like the living world, with things like the true simultaneous turns, with the deep crafting system. And so when they talk to me, I learn so much from them all the time, but they're so inspired by what's come before and so inspired by all the things that they've created, but they want to find ways to break ground, to make new experiences for the Forex fans, for the turn-based strategy fans, for the you know, millions of gamers that love these games worldwide. And I like to think of Aura as being almost kind of a love letter to them at the same time as being a, a, you know, a grand experiment, something brand new that they haven't seen before. And Livy, you guys are working very closely with your communities, right? Yes, very closely. Um, the wonderful thing about our History Untold is that we've been able to really work with our communities to help develop the game. Uh, we have a wonderful insider program where fans from all over the world have been playing the game even before we've shared gameplay here. Um, we've been inviting fans to play the game and um, getting their feedback. And so we've made a number of changes to the game um, based on feedback from real fans. And it's been, um, it's been a really wonderful and delightful experience and just such a wonderful community to help be a part of. Yeah. It's so amazing to see something grow like when lots of people are involved and 
sometimes maybe surprises even come up, Matt. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, the Insider program has been so fantastic and it's been such a great thing to be able to help uh, you know, furnish for our friends at Oxide Games for being able to give them real feedback. For over a year now, we've had tens of thousands of gamers in our Insider program history game fans, strategy game fans, and uh, thousands have played in our technical alphas that we've run, and we were planning to run several more before we were ready for launch in 2024, and we're really excited about that opportunity. So if you would like to become an insider, you can go to www.arahistoryuntold.com and click on the Join the Insider program and become an insider today. There's no fee to sign up, it's totally free, it's totally fun, and it's a great way to stay up to date on the game and stay up to date on the development, but also to put your hat in the ring for potentially getting to play early builds of the game before it comes out in 2024. That is so exciting. All right, so, so next at step. this point, we're pretty close to the end of our demo. Um, we could keep playing forever, I could just keep going, and I, I have this <laughs> urge to just keep playing. I just, I just built a farm on some rice I'm very excited about, I'm cultivating that. I, I'm, I'm at the cusp of something great. We've uncovered there, even more There's the always map. something to do, it's always. always. Yeah. And, and honestly, we have barely scratched the surface of our history untold here today. There is so much more to come in the modern era as you move forward into act two and act three of the game. As as you go and look at things like the standings and the prestige system that allows you to discover how well you're doing against other nations and hopefully find your way uh, to become one of the most prestigious in the world, all the different ways you can accomplish things. It's, it's truly a very large game, a very deep game, and um, it's been extremely gratifying to have the chance to share it with you today. So I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming to our Gamescom preview. No, thank you for this lovely insight. And I mean, watching was already so much fun and I really, really can't wait to get my hands on the game because I so want to play it. Well, of course, Melly, it was great having you and um, you should absolutely join the Insider program if you like what you've seen. I will, I will. And you guys, hopefully too. And one important part of Ara is also the music. And we have a lovely inside look on how this all came together. So enjoy. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is a grand strategy game where you basically are taking a nation from the very dawn of time, 6000 BC, dawn of humanity, and nurturing these people and building it up through the ages to the future age. You are learning technologies, unlocking new kinds of buildings, taking care of your people's happiness, their wealth, and all these different things until the future age, and then hopefully, you know, winning the game at that point. began Aura way back in the day, one of the very first things we did was really approach designing this title with the music in mind. It wasn't an afterthought. We weren't like, oh no, we need to go find audio. It was really from the ground up. How will music help to enhance the player's experience and really key them into the emotive state of what's happening currently in the game. I feel that we've created something that's uniquely interactive. Uh, especially for a Forex strategy title. We take actual data from the game and use that to drive the musical experience. Music and audio in general is very important to Oxide as a culture. So often you've seen these games where people turn the music off because they've heard the same song over and over again and it gets dull and boring and that's sad because audio has a really unique way to really connect with people emotionally and really get them invested and immersed in an experience that they're in. And when you lose that audio, you're losing so much emotive power for the player. So I really wanted to make sure from the very beginning that music was deeply incorporated into how the game was designed. All the cues were recorded in five different layers. And it wasn't as simple as, all right, now we're going to do the strings or the, now the brass and the winds. Every layer has a mix of all kinds of different instruments because we didn't want it to just feel like unnaturally separated. We want it to each layer to be able to stand on its own. One of the goals with this soundtrack was to try to replace all that sampled music with live instrument playing. And we did that. And um, I'm really proud of that fact, to be honest with you. 
Yeah, and what's really interesting is as you play, um, you know, the game is tracking what you're doing, your choices are impacting the world, the map, um, your opponents, and the music manager is actually also then pinging this data into the actual soundtrack where it's turning different layers on, turning different instruments on and off, and then also switching seamlessly between these different themes. So as you're playing, you will never hear the same soundscape because you're never going to be taking the same actions from turn to turn. So it is this really, truly dynamic, unique experience that does mirror your gameplay and hopefully the player's actual emotive state in the moment as well. Absolutely. I wanted to try something new in the way of interactive music. We wanted it to be completely data-driven and new every playthrough. We also remember you employed these things which you coined verticals. So it isn't like it's just sound effects, like binks and bonks and clicks. That, so when you mouse around and do things, you actually have sounds that are musical in nature, like little motifs that will pop up and then interact with the music. Yeah, exactly. Kind of That's another interactive feature of the soundtrack. There are a very diverse number of types of instruments from all over the world and from all different time periods, ancient to modern, you know. We looked for instruments from every Anywhere. time, period, and culture that we could think of. You know, nothing was off limits. We actively searched to include as much mm -hmm. as we possibly could. If for no other reason, for the vast variety of sounds. I think there's something that's unique in the music that is a merging of cultures, you know, and so that was, that was something that was very conscious. We really are trying to push the boundaries on what can be done now um, in games and really trying to make a new experience. You know, I'm really happy with how it turned out. The other thing that I'm truly proud of, even though I didn't really have much to do with it, mm -hmm. is just the look of the game, the living world, and how we were able to integrate audio into that. Um, it's just uh, something really special. Day two here at Gamescom may be coming to an end, but don't worry, because the Xbox Gamescom party doesn't end here. That's right, Maxi. Day three is right around the corner, where we'll go behind the scenes with Ninja Theory for Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. And joining us on stage will be Senua herself, Melina Jurgens. Plus, we're bringing you more gameplay from titles like Payday 3, Party Animals, Towerborn, and from 400 feet above Cologne, City Skylines 2. Ooh. Plus, we'll traverse the Austrian Alps with a look at Dungeons of Hinterberg. Basically, it's going to be a good time and you shouldn't miss it. So join us right back here tomorrow for our coverage of Gamescom 2023. Danke und viel Spaß beim Zocken!